Encyclical Letter Beneficia Dei on the 25th Anniversary of His Pontificate by Pope Pius IX. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Encyclical Epistle of Our Most Holy Lord Pius IX by Divine Providence Pope To all patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops, and other ordinaries in the grace and communion of the Apostolic See. Pious Pope the Ninth. Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolical Benediction. The benefits of God call upon us to celebrate His goodness, whilst they manifest anew His gracious protection over us and the glory of His Majesty. For now has elapsed the twenty-fifth year since, by the dispensation of God, we undertook the ministry of this our apostleship, of which the troublous times are so fresh in your memory that they require no long mention from us. Truly, venerable brethren, is it evident from such a series of events that the Church militant hold on her course amidst frequent conflicts and victories. Truly does God rule and govern the changes of affairs in the world, which is his footstool. Truly does he often employ weak and contemptible instruments, thereby to fulfill the designs of his wisdom. Jesus Christ our Lord, the author and supreme ruler of the Church, which he purchased with his blood, has, for this long period of the duration of our apostolic service, Deigned to govern and support by his grace and strength our weakness and littleness to the greater glory of his name and to the benefit of his people, the merits of most blessed Peter, prince of the apostles, who in the sea of Rome ever lives and rules, pleading in our behalf. Therefore have we, being upheld by his divine aid, and continually availing ourselves of the counsels of our venerable brethren the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, and, not unfrequently, of yours also, venerable brethren, who were present here in Rome with us in great concourse, doing honor to this chair of truth by the brightness of your virtue and of your unanimous devotion, been able, in the course of this our pontificate, to define in accordance with our own wishes and those of the Catholic world, by a dogmatic definition, the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mother of God. Also to decree heavenly honors to numerous heroes of our religion, whose guardianship, and especially that of the Divine Mother, will, we doubt not, be exercised in favor of the Church in these her times of adversity. Equally was it by the aid and for the glory of God that we were enabled to carry forth the light of the true faith into distant and inhospitable regions by the mission of evangelical laborers. In many places to establish the order of the ecclesiastical hierarchy and to brand with solemn condemnation the errors especially prevalent in this age and alike hostile to human reason, to good morals, to Christianity, and to the state. Moreover, by the help of God, we have been able to join together in as firm and solid union as possible the ecclesiastical and civil power, both in Europe and in the parts of America, and to provide for many needs of the Eastern Church, which, from the commencement of our apostolic ministry, we have always regarded with fatherly affection. Lastly, it has been recently vouchsafed to us to commence and carry forward the work of the Ecumenical Council, of which, however, the great results had been only partially attained, some of them being still awaited by the Church when, on account of well-known circumstances, we were compelled to decree its suspension. Nor have we ever failed, venerable brethren, by the help of God, to carry out all that the rights and duties of our civil government made incumbent upon us. You remember how, at the commencement of our pontificate, we were greeted with congratulations and plaudits, soon to be turned into such insults and attacks as drove us from this our well-beloved city into exile. But when, 
by the general efforts of Catholic loyalty and valor in peoples and princes, we were restored to this pontifical see. Immediately we exerted all our energy and endeavors to promote and secure to our faithful subjects the solid and not fallacious prosperity which we have always recognized as the most important duty of our civil princedom. But the cupidity of a neighboring potentate coveted the territory of our temporal government and obstinately preferred the counsels of the sex of perdition to our paternal and oft-repeated admonitions. And at last, as you well know, far outdoing the shamelessness of the prodigal son whom we read of in the gospel, he has attacked and taken with force and arms this our city, which he claimed as his own and now retained in his possession, against all right, as if it were the share of substance which fell to his lot. Venerable brethren, it is impossible but that we should be greatly moved to indignation and sorrow by the nefarious usurpation under which we are suffering. We are very grievously afflicted at the great wickedness of the design which aims, if it were possible, at the downfall of our spiritual power and of the kingdom of Christ on earth, together with the destruction of the temporal power. We are afflicted at the sight of so many grave evils, especially those by which the eternal salvation of our people is imperiled. And in this affliction, nothing is so grievous to us as that by reason of the coercion put upon our liberty, we are debarred from applying the remedies needful for such evils. Added to these sources of affliction to us, venerable brethren, is another in that protracted and deplorable series of calamities and misfortunes which has so long smitten down and crushed the noble French nation, which have been enormously aggravated recently by the unheard-of excesses perpetrated by a ferocious and abandoned horde, the offscourings of society, and particularly by the dreadful wickedness of the impious parasite consummated in the murder of our venerable brother, the Archbishop of Paris. You can well understand what feelings these events must excite in us when they have filled the whole world with fear and horror. Lastly, venerable brethren, there is one bitterness greater than any other. It is to see so many rebellious sons involved in so many and so terrible ecclesiastical censures and yet disregarding our fatherly appeals, disregarding their own salvation, disregarding and despising the season of repentance still allowed them by God, obstinately determining rather to brave the divine vengeance in eternity than, in time, to experience the benefit of mercy. Now, however, through so many vicissitudes, under the protection of the most merciful God, we behold the approach of the anniversary of our election, on which we, having succeeded to the see of blessed Peter, although as far as possible from equaling his merits, have yet shared his length of years in apostolic service. This truly is a new, it is a singular and great instance of the divine goodness. It is conferred by the dispensation of God on us alone, out of the great succession of our holy predecessors in the long course of nineteen centuries. In it we recognize the wonders of divine mercy towards us, seeing that, during this time, we have been thought worthy to suffer persecution for the sake of justice, and beholding that marvelous sentiment of devotion and love with which the Christian people is strongly moved all over the world, and is drawn with unanimous affection towards this holy see. As these gifts have been conferred on us wholly unworthy, so we find our own powers quite unequal to the duty of returning due thanks. Wherefore we pray the Immaculate Virgin, Mother of God, to teach us, in the same spirit as she did, to give glory to the Most High in those sublime words, Pesit mihi magna qui potenest. He that is mighty hath done to me great things. You also we entreat, venerable brethren, that you, together with your flocks, would offer to God with us hymns of praise and thanksgiving. We say, in the words of Leo the Great, Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together, so that the entire catalogue of favors and mercies which we have received may be referred to the praise of him their author. And do you make known to your people our burning charity towards them? 
and our deepest gratitude for their noble testimonies and acts of filial piety so long and so perseveringly exhibited towards us. And we, as far as regards ourselves, while we may use the words of the royal prophet and say, In colatos meus prolongatus est, we stand in need of the help of your prayers, that we may obtain strength and confidence to render up our soul to the prince of pastors, in whose bosom is refreshment from the ills of this turbulent and troublesome life, and the blessed haven of eternal calm and peace. And in order that the blessings which he of his bounty hath bestowed on our pontificate may redound to the greater glory of God, we, venerable brethren, do on this occasion unlock the treasury of spiritual graces and do grant to you in each of your dioceses on the 16th or 21st day of the present month or on any other day to be chosen by you at your discretion the power of imparting the papal benediction with the application of a plenary indulgence in the accustomed form. And desiring to consult the spiritual benefit of the faithful, we do by these presents grant in the Lord to all the faithful, secular, and regular of both sexes, in whatever place of each of your respective dioceses they may be, that all who have made their sacramental confession and received Holy Communion shall offer up devout prayers for the concord of Christian princes, for the extirpation of heresies, and for the exaltation of our Holy Mother the Church, on that day which you by our authority shall have chosen and appointed for bestowing the aforesaid benediction, or in dioceses where the see is vacant, on the day which the vicar's capitular for the time being shall have so chosen and appointed, shall be enabled and empowered to obtain plenary indulgence for all their sins. And we do not at all doubt, but that by this opportunity, all Christian people will be the more effectually stirred up to prayer, and that so, prayers being multiplied, we may deserve to attain the divine mercy which the view of present evils obliges us most earnestly to implore. For yourselves, venerable brethren, we beseech Almighty God to grant you constancy, heavenly hope, and all consolation, and we intend, as the augury of these graces and the testimony of our special regard, the apostolic benediction, which, from the full exuberance of our heart, we hereby impart to yourselves, to your clergy, and to the people committed to your charge. Given at Rome at St. Peter's on the 4th of June, being the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, in the year of our Lord, 1871, in the 25th year of our pontificate. Pious Pope Nine. End of encyclical letter Beneficia Dei on the 25th anniversary of his pontificate by Pope Pius the Ninth. Read by Maria Angela Aragon. Encyclical letter Saint Be Venerabilis Fratres. Thanksgiving for 25 years of pontificate by Pope Pius IX. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Encyclical Epistle of His Holiness Pope Pius IX To all patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops, and other ordinaries in communion with the Holy See. Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolical Benediction Often, venerable brethren, during our long pontificate, have we turned to you and intimated how gratefully we have received the proofs of devotion and love which the God of all mercy has put it into your minds and into the minds of your faithful flocks to show to us in the apostolic see. When the enemies of God began to invade its civil dominion, in order that, if it were possible, they might prevail against Jesus Christ and his church, which is his body and the fullness thereof, you, venerable brethren, and the Christian people have, without ceasing, besought God, whom the winds and the sea obey, that he would still the tempest. Nor have you desisted from repeating again and again the testimonies of your love, or from discharging every duty by which you could console us in our tribulation. And when this city, the capital of the whole Catholic world, was wrested from us, and we were placed at the disposal of those who had oppressed us, 
you, together with the multitude of the faithful of your dioceses, redoubled your prayers, and with your numerous denunciations you asserted the sacred rights of religion and justice that had been most audaciously trampled upon. And now that, by an event unknown since the days of St. Peter, and unprecedented in the whole succession of the Roman pontiffs, we have attained the twenty-sixth year of our pontificate in the chair of Rome. You have given such magnificent proofs of your joy on account of this great mercy granted to our littleness, and you have so brilliantly exhibited in action the vigorous life with which the entire household of Christ is animated, that we have been profoundly affected at it. And, uniting our prayers to you, we have been afresh encouraged to look with greater confidence than ever for the complete and absolute triumph of the Church. It has been most gratifying to us to know that in every part of the world the faithful have made, in vast crowds, pilgrimages to celebrated sanctuaries, and that great assemblages of Catholics have been gathered at those sanctuaries, and there, under the leadership of their own pastors, have publicly offered up their prayers and made their communions to thank God for the great mercy he has bestowed upon us, and to beseech him to give the victory to his church. We felt our sorrows alleviated, nay, turned into joy, at the congratulations contained in your letters, at your assurances of loyalty, at your prayers, and at the very numerous arrivals of Catholics from all parts, amongst whom were many distinguished by noble rank, and by ecclesiastical and civil dignities, and still more ennobled by their faith, all of whom, being united in feeling and in act, together with a large number of the citizens of Rome and of the provinces that have been seized on, from different and distant realms, have traveled hither with one accord, and have voluntarily exposed themselves to the same perils and insults to which we are exposed, in order that they might come face to face with us, and there testify the pious sentiments of themselves and their fellow citizens, and also might present to us volumes, containing many hundred thousand signatures of the faithful of all nations to addresses, in which they characterized in the severest terms the invasion of our princedom, and earnestly maintained that its restitution was demanded and enjoined by every principle of religion, justice, and even of civilization. By this occasion also, there hath accrued to us a receipt of money larger than ordinary, both poor and rich having exerted themselves to relieve the poverty that had been brought upon us, added to which there were also manifold presents of various kinds and of great value, forming a magnificent tribute of the productions of Christian art and genius, excellently adapted to exalt the twofold power, spiritual and royal, granted to us by Almighty God. There was also an extensive and splendid supply of sacred vestments and church furniture, out of which we were enabled to assist the poverty and meanness of a great many churches in different places. Truly it was a wondrous spectacle of Catholic unity, and one which clearly proved that the universal church, although spread over the whole world, and made up of nations differing in manners, in character, and pursuits, yet is animated by the same Spirit of God, and is all the more marvelously strengthened thereby, the more fiercely the impious persecute and distress her, and the more craftily they plot to cut her off from all human aid. Let, therefore, abundant and most hearty thanks be rendered to him who glorifies his own name, and at the same time by showing forth his ever-ready power and help, raises up our afflicted souls to the hope of final and certain triumph. If, however, we refer all the good things that we have received to God their giver, yet at the same time we do feel the utmost gratitude towards those who have been the agents of providence, and have discharged abundantly towards us all the duties of help, consolation, loyalty, devotion, and love. Lifting up our eyes and hands towards heaven, we offer to the Lord all that has been conferred on us in his name by our children, earnestly beseeching him that he would vouchsafe speedily to hear their united prayers for the liberty of the Holy See, for the victory of the Holy Church, and for the peace of the world, and that he would bountifully reward each one with earthly and heavenly blessings, which is beyond our power. In truth, we could have wished to express to each and to all personally our gratitude, and to give to each and to all the assurance of our warm affection. But the great number of presents 
letters and addresses that have come in from every quarter render this plainly impossible. In order, therefore, that our desire may in some manner be carried into effect, we communicate our sentiments to you, venerable brethren, first of all, and beg that you would announce and explain them fully to your clergy and to your flocks. And we exhort all that they continue instant in prayer unitedly with yourselves, and in full confidence of soul. For if the continual prayer of the just penetrateth the clouds, and turneth not back until the Most High regardeth, and Christ has promised that wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, and agree as to what they shall ask for, his heavenly Father will do whatsoever they shall ask. Much more must the Church Universal, by her continual and united prayer, obtain all that she asks for, so that, divine justice being appeased, she may behold the powers of hell crushed, the efforts of human malice defeated and brought to naught, and peace and justice restored to earth. But do you, venerable brethren, above all things, labor with your soul and strength to this end, that being ever united together in a close phalanx, you may confront the enemies of God, ever attacking, with fresh plots and violence, the church, with which no force shall ever destroy, that you may the more easily and successfully resist their onset and defeat their armies. This is what we do most earnestly desire and most fervently pray for. And with all our heart do we ask it for you and for the whole household of the Catholic Church. And as a pledge of that most wished for issue and of the divine favor, and as an undoubted proof of the special affection and gratitude that we feel towards you and each one of you, venerable brethren, we do from our inmost heart most lovingly impart to yourselves, your clergy and flocks, the apostolic benediction. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, August 5th, being the feast of St. Mary of the Esquiline, Our Lady at Nive. Anno Domini, 1871, in the 26th year of our pontificate. End of encyclical letter, Sepe Venerabilis Fratris, by Pope Pius IX. Read by Caleb Sudfeld. Encyclical letter, Quartu Supra, on the Church in Armenia, by Pope Pius IX. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Encyclical Letter of His Holiness Pope Pius IX on the Affairs of the Armenian Church To our Venerable Brethren, Antony Peter IX, Patriarch of Cilicia, the Archbishops and Bishops, and to our dear sons, the priests and faithful of the Armenian Rite, in favor and communion of the Apostolic See. Venerable Brethren and Dear Sons, Health and Apostolic Benediction 1. Twenty-four years have already elapsed since, at the season when the return of the sacred days recalls the advent of the new star that appeared in the east to the nations that were to be illuminated by his brightness, we addressed to the Orientals our letters apostolic, by which we desired to confirm the Catholics in the faith, and at the same time to bring back to the one fold of Christ those unhappily outside of the Catholic Church. At that moment, the joyful hope shone upon us that, by the help of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the purity of the Christian faith would be propagated more widely, and that zeal and Christian discipline would be seen to blossom again in the East. To bring about that result, we promise to employ our authority to fix and order that discipline according to the rule of the holy canons. Since then, God knows how much solicitude we have felt for the Orientals and with what charity our heart has embraced them. As for the measures we have taken to attain that end, they are known to all the world, and would to God that all the world understood them properly. But by an unfathomable judgment of God, it has come to pass that things have in no manner corresponded with our endeavor or with our cares, so that, instead of rejoicing, we have to complain and to groan by reason of the new scourge under which certain churches of the East are afflicted. 2. That which Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of the faith, long ago foresaw, 
for our warning, namely, that many should come in his name saying, I am Christ, and should seduce many. You have been compelled to see before your eyes and to have painful experience of. For the adversary and enemy of the whole human race, having three years since stirred up a fresh schism amongst the Armenians at Constantinople, is now exerting all his strength by means of the wisdom of this world, heretical discourses, trickery, subtlety, and fraud, nay even, wherever he is able, by force, to ruin the faith, to corrupt the truth, and to rend unity. St. Cyprian has lamented and has at the same time exposed such hypocrisy and such trickery when he said, The devil draws men away from the church, and when they seemed to be already approaching the light, and almost to have escaped the darkness of the world, he throws fresh darkness over their ignorance, to the end that, declining from the doctrines and the obedience of the gospel of Christ, they may still nevertheless call themselves Christians, and that, walking all the while in darkness, they may imagine that they possess the light. So are they cajoled and deceived by that enemy who, according to the words of the apostle, transfigures himself into an angel of light, and sends his agents, like the ministers of righteousness, to preach the night instead of the day, death instead of salvation, despair under pretext of hope, perfidy under color of faith, and antichrist under the name of Christ to the end that, lying with the semblance of truth, they may, by their wiles, draw away those that listen to them from the power of the truth. 3. Now, although the beginnings of this new schism have been, as commonly happens, involved in much obscurity, yet had we anticipated its wickedness and its perils, and we had at once opposed them by two letters apostolic, one written on the 24th of February, 1870, and commencing with the words, Non sine gravissimo, and the other of the 20th of May, in the same year, and commencing with the words, Quo impensiore. But the thing went on so that the authors and abettors of the schism dared, in spite of the exhortations, admonitions, and censures of the Apostolic See, to elect a pseudo-patriarch. This election we have declared to be absolutely null and schismatical, both as to the elect and the electors. We laid upon them canonical penalties in our letter of the 11th March, 1871, commencing with the words, Ubi Prima. Now, after having seized with violence upon the churches of the Catholics, after having driven into exile the lawful patriarch, our venerable brother, Antony Peter the Ninth, after having invaded Vi et Armis, the patriarchal see of Cilicia, which is at the Lebanon, they have taken forcible possession of the civic prefecture itself. They have imposed themselves on the Catholic Armenian nation, and since then have been striving by every means to draw it into separation as they themselves are from the communion of the apostolic see and the obedience that is due to it. Amongst them, the man who labors chiefly for these ends is one of the neo-schismatic priests, John Capulian by name who had previously stirred up the people and fomented schism in the city of Diarbekir, or Amida, and who for this fact had been publicly and by name excommunicated and cut off from the Catholic Church by sentence of our venerable brother Nicholas, Archbishop of Mardin, delegate apostolic in Mesopotamia and the other countries acting by our authority. For, after having received from the pseudo-patriarch a sacrilegious consecration as bishop, this unfaithful priest took possession of the powers of a bishop, and by persuasion, or public menace, assumes to have placed under his authority the Catholics of the Arminian rite. If this could ever take place, the Catholics would be again brought to that miserable condition to which they were reduced forty years ago, when they were subjected to the authority of the old schismatics of their rite. 4. As for us, According to the custom of our predecessors, whose authority, patronage, and support the most illustrious fathers and bishops of the East have always claimed under similar circumstances, we have neglected nothing to remove from you so great evils. It was with that view that we sent to Constantinople our legate extraordinary. Also for that purpose, 
and in order that we might not be reproached hereafter for having left anything undone, that we ourselves wrote a private letter to the most exalted Ottoman emperor, to the end that the injuries inflicted on the Catholic Armenians might be redressed according to the laws of justice, and that the expelled pastor might be restored to his flock. But obstacles to the fulfillment of our desires were created by those who dare to call themselves Catholics when they are the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. 5. Accordingly, things are plainly come to such a pass that it is greatly to be feared lest the authors of the new schism, while they plunge into wickedness themselves, may succeed in seducing and leading into the path of perdition those who are weak in the faith or who are lacking in prudence as well amongst the Armenians as amongst Catholics of other rites. Therefore it is that by reason of our apostolic charge, we are compelled to speak again to you and to warn all the people, dispelling the darkness and the thick mists which, as we well know, have been gathering around the truth to the end that we may confirm those who are steadfast, that we may sustain those who are weak, and that we may bring back, by God's help, those who are miserably separated from the Catholic unity and from truth, if indeed they will listen, which with our soul we ask of God. 6. The greatest deceit that is made use of to cloak the new schism is the name of Catholic, which its authors and adherents have the audacity to assume, notwithstanding the condemnations pronounced upon them by our authority and our judgment. In effect, Heretics and schismatics have never failed thus to call themselves Catholics and to publish the most plausible things in their own honor so as to draw princes and peoples into the error. St. Jerome, amongst others, points this out when he says, The heretics are accustomed to say to their king or to Pharaoh, We are the sons of the sages who have transmitted to us from the beginning the apostolic doctrine. We are the sons of the ancient kings who are called kings of the philosophers, and in us the science of the scriptures is added to the wisdom of the world. 7. And to prove that they are Catholics, the neo-schismatics appeal to a certain declaration of faith which they say was drawn up by themselves on the 6th of February, 1870, and which they assert to differ in nothing from the Catholic faith. But when has it been allowed to anyone to prove himself a Catholic by drawing up at his own choice formulas of faith, in which it is usual to conceal whatever it does not please him to show? On the contrary, to be a Catholic it is necessary, as the whole of the Church's history proves, to subscribe absolutely everything that is professed by the Church. 8. What completes the proof that the formula of faith so drawn up by them is captious and full of fraud is that they have rejected the declaration of profession of faith proposed as usual on our authority. Subscription to this profession had been prescribed by our venerable brother Anthony Joseph, Archbishop of Tyana, Delegate Apostolic at Constantinople, who intimated the same to them by a letter addressed to them on the 29th September in the same year. In effect, It is contrary, as well to the divine institution of the Church, as to her constant and perpetual tradition, to admit that anyone can rightly profess the Catholic faith and truly claim to be a Catholic who does not satisfy the prescriptions of the Holy Apostolic See. For it is to this See, by reason of its primacy, that the Church, that is to say, the universal body of the faithful, ought to adhere. He then who leaves the chair of Peter, on whom the Church is founded, cannot without a lie assert that he is within the church. For he is a schismatic and a sinner who sets up another chair against the chair of St. Peter, from which emanate the rights belonging to that venerable community. 9. And this was well understood by the most illustrious bishops of the Oriental churches. Thus, at the Synod of Constantinople, held A.D. 536, Memnus, bishop of that city, made publicly, with the approbation of the fathers, the following declaration. As for us, your charity knows that we follow the apostolic see and are obedient to it. We have in our communion all who are in communion with it, and all whom it condemns are alike condemned by us. 
and with even greater fullness and earnestness did St. Maximus, abbot of Scutari and confessor of the faith, say, speaking of Pyrrhus, the monotholite, If he wishes neither to be a heretic nor to be called one, let him not try to satisfy this or that person. For as all are scandalized by him when one is scandalized, so if he satisfy one, all shall be satisfied. Let him then hasten to satisfy all men by satisfying the sea of Rome. For Rome, once satisfied, all men everywhere will hold him for a pious and orthodox person. Otherwise, it is in vain that he talks, he who thinks to persuade or to take in all those that are like me, and who refuses to implore the Most Holy Pope and the Most Holy Church of Rome, that is to say, the Apostolic See, which, by virtue of God made flesh, of the Holy Synods, the Holy Texts, and the Holy Canons, commands throughout all the earth all the holy churches of God, and has authority over them all with the power of binding and loosing. Once more, this is why John, Bishop of Constantinople, taking his part in what was soon to become the Eighth Ecumenical Council, declared that those who have separated themselves from the Church's communion, that is to say, those who are not in all things in accord with the Apostolic See, their names ought not to be pronounced in the celebration of the Holy Mysteries whereby he clearly intimated that he did not hold them for Catholics, all which is of such importance and of so great weight that whosoever shall have been adjudged a schismatic by the Roman pontiff must not usurp the name of Catholic, so long as he does not thoroughly acknowledge and obey the plenary power of the sovereign pontiff. 10. Now, as the neoschismatics are not in the smallest degree disposed towards such submission, they have, imitating in this the practice of recent heretics, taken refuge in a new pretext by pretending that the sentence of schism and excommunication passed upon them by our venerable brother the Archbishop of Tyana, delicate apostolic at Constantinople, was unjust, and consequently of no validity or force. They have therefore refused to submit to it, and have put forward as a reason that they could not do so lest the faithful who have been deceived by their ministrations should be deemed heretics. Now these pretexts are altogether novel. The ancient fathers of the church never recognized or admitted them. For in the whole church every man knows that the see of St. Peter the Apostle has the right of loosing whatever is bound by the sentence of every pontiff, forasmuch as it has the right of judging all the churches, and it is not lawful for any man to judge contrary to its judgment. Therefore it was that when the Jansenist heretics dared to teach similar doctrines and pretended that the excommunication inflicted by the lawful prelate might be contemned under color that it was unjust, and consequently that each person might, notwithstanding it, do whatever he deemed it his duty to do. Our predecessor Clement XI of happy memory, by his constitution Unigenitus, proscribed and condemned those propositions as being in no way different from those articles of John Wycliffe, which had been previously condemned by the Synod of Constance and by Martin V. In fact, although it might happen that any man, through human infirmity, might be unjustly afflicted by the censures of his bishop, yet it is of necessity, as our holy predecessor St. Gregory the Great teaches, that he who is under the hand of the shepherd fears to be condemned even unjustly and does not rashly resist the judgment of his pastor, lest, being condemned even unjustly, he who is not guilty might incur guilt by reason of the pride by which he was impelled to such resistance. But if we ought to be in fear of rebellion, even when we are unjustly condemned by our pastor, what shall be said of those who, being justly condemned because they have been rebellious against their pastor and against this apostolic see, tear and rend to pieces by a new schism the seamless robe, that is to say, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ. 11. But the charity with which priests, above all, are bound to encompass the faithful, ought, according to the precept of the apostle, to proceed from a pure heart, a good conscience, and an unfeigned faith. 1 Timothy 1.5. And when enumerating the virtues by which we ought to exhibit ourselves truly as the ministers of God, he adds, Exhibit in yourselves charity unfeigned, that is, in the word of truth. In fine, Jesus Christ himself, being God, who is charity, 
has plainly declared that we must hold for heathens and publicans those who hear not the church. Lastly, our predecessor, St. Gelasius, replied to Euphemius, bishop of Constantinople, who had alleged similar reasons in opposition to him. The flock ought to follow the shepherd who leads them to wholesome pastures, and it is not for the shepherd to follow the flock when it wanders along roads that lead it to destruction, for the people ought to be taught not to be followed, and if they refuse to listen to us when we warn them of what is permitted and what is not, we ought not to bend to their will. 12. But the schismatics tell us that it is not a matter of dogma, but of discipline that is in question. For as it was discipline to which our constitution, Reversurus, published July 12, 1867, had reference, they therefore say they cannot be refused the name or the rights of Catholics. How futile and vain this subterfuge is, we doubt not that you perfectly well perceive. For they who audaciously resist the lawful prelates of the church, and above all the sovereign pontiff, who refuse to obey their commands and even contemn their dignity, such men the Catholic Church has always held as schismatics, and as these acts lie at the door of the Armenian faction at Constantinople, none can deem them exempt from the charge of schism, even if they had not been condemned by the chief of the apostolic authority. In effect, the Church, as the fathers teach, is the people united to the priest and the flock adhering to its shepherd. By consequence, the bishop is in the church and the church is in the bishop. And if any man is not with the bishop, he is no more with the church. Moreover, as our predecessor Pius VI remarked in his letters apostolic, in which he condemned the civil constitution of the clergy in France, discipline is often so incorporated with dogma and so influences its preservation in all its purity, that the holy councils have not hesitated on several occasions to separate, by an anathema, the violators of discipline from the communion of the Church. 13. But the new schismatics have gone further. For it is impossible for schism not to invent some heresy, so that it may appear to have justly separated from the Church. They have not feared then to accuse us, us and this holy see, as if, having overstepped the limits of our power, we had, by issuing certain regulations of discipline to be observed in the Armenian church, put our sickle into another man's harvest. And in effect, they maintain that the Oriental churches are not bound to keep communion and unity of faith with us, but that, in all that relates to discipline, they are in no wise subject to the apostolic authority of St. Peter. Now, not only is this doctrine manifestly heretical, since the definition and declaration of the Vatican Council concerning the force and nature of the pontifical power, but in all times the Church Catholic has held this doctrine as heretical and rejected it as much. So the bishops of the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon, proclaiming in a glorious manner by their acts the supreme authority of the Apostolic See, humbly asked of our predecessor St. Leo his approbation and even his confirmation of their decrees concerning discipline. 14. And in truth, the successor of St. Peter, by the very fact that he is established in his place, possesses of right divine the guardianship of the whole flock of Christ, to the end that, in concert with the episcopate, he may exercise the power of universal government. But as for the other bishops, the particular guardianship of their flock is given to them not of right divine, but by ecclesiastical right, not by the mouth of Jesus Christ, but by hierarchical ordinance, to the end that they may extend over the flock the ordinary power of government. But if the right to make this appointment were denied to St. Peter and his successors, the prerogatives even of the most ancient churches would be shaken. For if Jesus Christ willed that St. Peter should have something in common with the other princes, he has never given, save through him, that which he is granted to the others. And in fact, he it is who gave dignity to the See of Alexandria, where he sent them the evangelist disciple. He it is who confirmed the See of Antioch, where he remained seven years, although he had to quit it. And as regards the decrees that were passed at the Council of Chalcedon concerning the See of Constantinople, we have the testimony of the Emperor Marcion and of the Bishop of Constantinople himself, Anatolius, 
who confessed that to these decrees the approbation and confirmation of the apostolic see was absolutely necessary. 16. Thus, then, unless we are to discard the Church's constant and perpetual tradition, abundantly confirmed by the testimony of the Fathers, the Neoschismatics for all that they proclaim themselves Catholics, cannot in any wise persuade themselves that they are entitled to the name. And if the cunning craftiness of heretical trickery were not sufficiently evident and well known, we should be unable to comprehend how the Ottoman government could consider as Catholics those whom it knows to have been by our judgment and authority separated from the Catholic Church. In effect, as the Catholic religion may be practiced in freedom and safety under the Ottoman dominion, according to the decrees of the most exalted emperor, it follows that, of necessity, whatever is necessary for that religion as is the primacy of jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff, must be admitted, and that to his judgment as head and universal and supreme pastor must be left the duty of deciding who is Catholic and who not. That is a principle which is recognized by all nations, and the same must hold good if a mere human and private society were in question. 17. But these neo-schismatics assert that they do not at all attack the institutions of the Catholic Church. They say that they desire only one thing, to defend the rights of their churches and of their nation, nay, those of His Imperial Highness the Emperor, which they accuse us of having violated, so that in all the present troubles they are not afraid to throw the blame upon us and upon this Holy See, as once did the Achaean schismatics to our predecessor St. Gelasius, and before them the Arians to our predecessor Liberius, whom they accused to the Emperor Constantius of having refused to condemn St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, and to receive those heretics into his communion. Whereat, one may feel sorrow, but not surprise, for as the Most Holy Pontiff Gelasius wrote to the Emperor Anastasius, there is often a propensity in sick people to blame the physicians who would restore them to health by suitable remedies, rather than abandon the appetites that are injurious to them. As, then, such appear to be the principal pleas by which the neoschismatics conciliate the favor and obtain the esteem of the powerful for their detestable cause, it is necessary, in order that the faithful may not be led into error, to treat of them at greater length than if it were simply a question of refuting their calumnies. 18. Certainly we do not mean here to recall to memory the situation into which the Catholic churches established in the East had come after that schism had prevailed, and God had avenged upon the empire of the Greeks, by the overthrow of that empire, the division which had been made in the unity of the church. Neither is it within our design to recall to mind how our predecessors labored as soon as ever it was possible for them to do so, to bring back the wandering sheep to the one true flock of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, and although the fruits have not equaled the labor, several churches and diverse rites have, by the mercy of God, returned to Catholic truth and unity. It is these churches which the apostolic see, taking them in their arms as newborn babes, is occupied more especially in protecting, in order to confirm them in the Catholic faith and to keep them safe from every taint of heresy. 19. Also, Upon the information that there were spreading in the East the impious doctrines of a sect that had already been rejected by the Holy See, and which tended before all things to pull down the primacy of the pontifical jurisdiction, Pius VII of happy memory, being strongly moved by the gravity of the danger, judged it good to provide against it at once, lest in these conflicts, and in the vain equivocations heaped up around these questions, the true sense of the words transmitted by their ancestors should by little and little be effaced from the minds of faithful Christians. To that effect, he caused to be addressed to the patriarchs and the oriental bishops the old formulary of our predecessor, St. Hermistas, and at the same time he ordered them that, so far as the jurisdiction of each of them reached, they should prescribe to all bishops and to all priests of the regular and secular clergy having charge of souls to subscribe, if they had not already done so, the profession of faith required by Pope Urban VII. The same thing was also to be exacted of those who were in future to be admitted to ecclesiastical orders or promoted to any sacred ministry. 20. Now some time afterwards, 
that is to say in the year 1806, there was held at the monastery of Carcaphus, situated in the diocese of Beirut, a synod called the Synod of Antioch. The acts of that synod were borrowed secretly and fraudulently. From the synod of Pistoia, already condemned, and including, part textually and part in an equivocal adaptation, some of the propositions of that synod of Pistoia already condemned by the Holy See of Rome. Other propositions savored of Jansenism and Bayanism were opposed to ecclesiastical authority, were subversive of the Church's constitution, and militated against sound doctrine and the discipline sanctioned by the Church. All those decrees of the Council of Carcaphus were then, unknown to the Apostolic See, printed in Arabia in the year 1810, and they had stirred up numerous quarrels amongst the bishops when at length the synod was disapproved and condemned by our predecessor of happy memory, Gregory the Sixteenth. At the same time, the Pope ordered the bishops to borrow the rules of government and of doctrine from the other ancient synods, long since approved by the Holy See. Would to God that the synod having been condemned, the errors with which it abounded had been put an end to, for those perverse doctrines did not cease to spread themselves secretly in the East, seeking the favorable opportunity when they should be able to come forth before the eyes of all men. The rebellion, which was unsuccessfully attempted twenty years ago, the neoschismatics have dared to accomplish. 21. Now, discipline being the bond of faith, it was needful that the Holy See, in accordance with its right and its duty, should apply itself to the defense of it. In the performance of this most serious duty, Rome has never been wanting, although through the untowardness of times and circumstances, she has sometimes taken account of present necessities while awaiting the better times which God's mercy shall at length grant us for a time. In fact, at the instance of our predecessors, Leo XII and Pius VIII, supported by the Catholic sovereigns of Austria and France, the most exalted Ottoman emperor, having recognized the separation which exists between Catholics and heretics, removed the former from under the civil jurisdiction of the latter and allowed them to appoint for themselves, according to the civil custom of the country, a chief or prefect. At that period, it was for the first time permitted to establish in all security at Constantinople bishops of the Armenian rite possessing ordinary authority. It was permitted to build Catholic churches of the same rite and to profess and practice publicly the Catholic worship, so that our predecessor Pius VIII of happy memory once erected at Constantinople a primatial and archiepiscopal see of the Armenians, urged by his solicitude in order that Catholic discipline might there opportunely and becomingly flourish anew. 22. Some years subsequently, when it appeared to us opportune to do so, we erected episcopal sees suffragan to the primatial see of Constantinople, and then was established the method to be observed for the election of bishops. Subsequently, provision was made by the authority of the sultan himself that the power of the civil prefect should not encroach on things sacred, which is completely opposed to the laws of the Catholic Church. This was settled by the imperial diploma of the 7th of April 1857, given to our venerable brother, Antony Hassoun, then primate of that see. Lastly, when, at the request of the Armenians themselves, we had, by the letters apostolical Reversurus, united the primatial church of Constantinople to the patriarchal see of Cilicia with the abolition of the former title, it seemed opportune and even necessary to sanction the principal heads of that discipline by the authority of this constitution. For that purpose, the Patriarchal Synod was assembled, which, by our apostolical letter, Commissum, dated the 12th of July, 1867, we ordered to assemble as soon as possible, in order that it might labor with diligence to establish perfect order of discipline throughout the whole Armenian Patriarchate. 23. But the enemy soon busied himself in sowing the darnel in the Armenian Church of Constantinople, some people having raised the question of the civil prefecture, which they accused the new patriarch of having monopolized. From this controversy there soon arose great trouble, and the same patriarch was accused of having betrayed the rights of the nation, because he had received, as he was in Catholic duty bound to do, our constitution. From that time forward, 
all the counsels, all the machinations, and all the sarcasms of the dissidents were leveled at that constitution. 24. Two things, before all others, were found fault with in that constitution, namely, its regulations about the election of bishops, and its decisions relating to the administration of corporate property. For the dissidents calumniously accused these regulations of being encroachments upon the rights of the nation, and even upon those of his imperial highness. Now although all that we have defined upon this double subject ought to be perfectly well known, yet we are pleased to say it over again, for there have always been and still are very many who speak in the vanity of their mind through the ignorance that is in them. And there are others who, like diviners and soothsayers, speak continually that which they know not. 25. We ordained that the patriarch should be chosen by the synod of the bishops, to the exclusion of laymen as electors, and even of clerics not invested with the episcopal character. We also forbade the person elected to take position of his office, in other words to be enthroned, before having received from the apostolic see the letters confirming him in his charge. As for the bishops, we ordained that they should be elected as follows. All the bishops of the province, assembled in synod, shall propose to the apostolic see three candidates chosen from amongst the ecclesiastics eligible. If it is impossible for all the bishops to come to the synod, the nomination shall be made by at least three diocesan bishops assembled in synod with the patriarch. The absent bishops shall send the threefold nomination in writing. That done, the Roman pontiff shall choose one of the candidates whom he shall place at the head of the vacant church. Lastly, we said that we did not doubt that the bishops would take pains always to propose worthy and suitable persons, so that we and our successors might never be compelled by the duty of our apostolic charge, ourselves to choose a candidate not proposed, and to place him at the head of the vacant church. 26. These regulations, if examined in a spirit free from partisan passion, will be seen to be in entire conformity with the holy canons and with the Catholic faith. As for the exclusion of laymen from the election of bishops, we must, if we would avoid asserting what is contrary to the Catholic faith, carefully distinguish between the right of choosing bishops and the opportunity afforded of rendering testimony as regards the life and manners of the candidates for election. The former pretension must be classed with the false maxims of Luther and Calvin, who went so far as to say that it was of right divine that the bishops should be chosen by the people. Now everyone knows that this false maxim was and is condemned by the Catholic Church, for never, either by right divine or by ecclesiastical right, have the people had the power of electing bishops or other ministers of the sacraments. 27. As to the testimony of the people in what concerns the life and manners of those who are to be promoted to the episcopate, since the Catholic bishops began to be driven from their sees by the violence of the Arians, who were favored by the Emperor Constantius, and installed their partisans in those sees, as St. Athanasius deplores, the necessity of the times constrained that the people should be called in to take part in the elections of bishops in order that they might be stirred up to maintain and protect in his see the bishop whom they knew had been chosen in their presence. And it is true that this custom was practiced for some time in the church, but as there resulted from it continual discords, tumults, and other abuses, the people had to be kept away from the elections, and the church had to dispense with their testimony or their desires on the subject of the person to be elected. For, as St. Jerome remarks, Often the judgment of the people and of the multitude is fallacious. When a priest has to be supported, every man tries to favor his own way of living, so that the nomination urged is not so much that of a good candidate as of a candidate who resembles yourself. 28. Nevertheless, we have willed that in the method of election to be observed, there be allowed to the bishop synod full liberty of making inquiry in the manner which may suit them best into the candidate's qualities, without excluding the people's testimony if that be agreeable to them. And, in point of fact, the acts transmitted to the Holy See attest that even after our constitution was published, this mode was employed by the Armenian bishops, 
when three years since they had to elect a bishop for the country of Sebast and Tokat. But we did not think, and we still do not think it fitting, to act in the same manner at the election of a patriarch, and that both, because of his eminent dignity and because he is placed at the head of all the bishops of his country, and because it appears from the acts transmitted to the Holy See that elections of patriarchs in every oriental rite have always been made by the bishops alone, unless when the contrary was required by pressing and extraordinary circumstances, as for example when it afforded a means for the Catholics to support themselves against the power and violence of the schismatics to whom they were subjected. For then, in choosing for themselves another patriarch, they clearly manifested by the act itself their separation from the schismatics, and confirmed their true and sincere conversion to the Catholic faith, which is what took place at the election of Abraham Peter I. 29. But what very many persons bear impatiently, and what they complain of, is, on the one hand, that we have reserved to this holy and apostolic see the right and the power of choosing the bishop, either in the list of three nominations or out of the same, and on the other hand, that we have forbidden the bishop-elect to be enthroned before that his election shall have been confirmed by the Roman pontiff. Upon these two points they object to us the customs of their churches and the canons, as though we had departed from the practice of the holy canons. To all which we might reply with our predecessor St. Gelasius, who was assailed by the occasion schismatics with the same calumny. They oppose to us the canons, he said, but they know not what they say, because it is they who violate them by refusing obedience to the first see of the church, which counsels them things wise and just. And in effect, it is those very canons which recognize the universal divine authority of St. Peter over the whole church, and it is they who proclaim, as was said at the Synod of Ephesus, that St. Peter lives now and always in his successors to exercise this judgment and authority. Also to those who thought that by the intervention of the Roman pontiff anything was subtracted from the privileges of the churches of the royal city of Constantinople, Stephen, Bishop of Larissa, was able to answer in confidence and with reason. The authority of the apostolic see which was granted by God our Savior to the Prince of the Apostles is above all the privileges of the holy churches, and all the churches of the world with one accord confess this. 30. Moreover, if you recall to your minds the history of your countries, you will therein find examples of the Roman pontiffs using that power whenever they have judged its exercise to be necessary for the safeguard of the churches of the East. Thus, the Roman pontiff Agapetus, by his own authority, deposed the bishop Antheus from the See of Constantinople. Thus also our predecessor Martin I entrusted his power for the East to John Bishop of Philadelphia, and in virtue, he said, of the apostolic authority granted to us of God by St. Peter, Prince of the Apostles, he prescribed to the aforesaid bishop to appoint bishops, priests, and deacons in all the towns of the provinces, then subject, either to the See of Jerusalem or to the See of Antioch. And if you refer to more recent times, you will see that the bishop of Mandan of the Armenians was elected and consecrated by the authority of the apostolic see. Lastly, our predecessors confided that care of the churches to the patriarchs of Cilicia, and it is by the good pleasure of the Holy See that the administration of the country of Mesopotamia has been committed to them. All that is perfectly in conformity with the power of this Supreme See of Rome, which the Church of the Armenians, except during the lamentable times of schism, has always recognized, proclaimed, and obeyed. Nor can anyone be surprised at this when he sees, enduring in its full vigor, even amongst those amongst you who are still separated from the Catholic faith, the ancient tradition of that great bishop and martyr Gregory, in whom you justly glory as the illuminator of your nation, of him whom St. Chrysostom calls a sun arising over the countries of the East, and whose bright rays bore light even to the Greeks. When one sees, we say, still extant the tradition that he received his authority from the apostolic see, whither he did not hesitate publicly to repair, notwithstanding the fatigues of a long and arduous journey. 31. Now, after having long reflected on ancient affairs and recent facts, we have been impelled by very grave and maturely weighed motives to take at length this decision, and that not at any suggestion of others, 
but of our own proper motion and certain knowledge. Indeed, every one may understand that upon the regular election of bishops depends the eternal happiness and often the temporal felicity of peoples. Now, considering the circumstances of time and place, it is important to exert vigilance that the authority of instituting holy bishops should be restored in its integrity to the Holy See from whence it emanates. Yet, however, it has seemed good to us so to temper this authority that there might be preserved to the synod of the bishops the power of electing the patriarch, and that it should also appertain to the same synod to propose for our choice three fitting candidates for the vacancies. This is what has been established by the constitution cited by us above. 32. Moreover, in order to stir up the lukewarm in this matter, and to add a stimulant to those who are already filled with zeal, we declared that we hoped that there would always be proposed to us persons fitting and worthy of so great an honor, so that we should never be constrained to put forward into the vacancy another person than one of the candidates. This point, however, had already been the object of the same precautions and of the same plan in the method established by us in 1853. Now we have learnt that from these words, moderate as they are, occasion has been taken by some to suspect that the synod's nomination of bishops will be of no weight with us and will be perfectly illusory. Others have gone further and have taken these words as concealing a design to hand over to Latin bishops the government of the Armenians. Truly, accusations so senseless do not deserve a reply, for those only could have made them who are carried away by their imaginations, and who have trembled for fear where there was no fear. As for our right to elect a person not named in the ternary list, we thought that we ought to pass it over in silence, in order that in future its exercise might never be made incumbent on the Holy See. But the right and the duty even had we made no mention of them, would have remained in their integrity, for the rights and privileges that have been given to this holy see by Jesus Christ himself may be attacked, but can never be overthrown, and it is not in the power of man to renounce a right divine which he may often be obliged to exercise by the will of God himself. 33. Moreover, although things have been established in this manner for the Armenians during more than twenty years, and although during that period it has several times been necessary to elect bishops, never, up to the present time, has it become necessary for us to make use of that power. Nor, even more recently, since the publication of the Constitution, Reversurus, have we received a list of three names out of which we have not been able to choose a bishop. As to what we said that we would arrange anew, so that the synod of bishops, by conforming themselves to the laws prescribed by us, might enable us never to have to elect a person not nominated, the new schism which has rent the Armenian church has been the obstacle which has prevented our doing this. But we have confidence that the times will never be so calamitous that the Roman pontiffs should be constrained to set over bishoprics candidates not proposed by the synod of bishops. 34. We have yet something more to add upon the subject of the prohibition by which the patriarchs cannot be enthroned previous to their confirmation by this apostolic see. And, first, all the ancient documents attest that never was the election of patriarchs regarded as complete without the consent and confirmation of the Roman pontiff. Secondly, it is proved by the demand made for it by the emperors that this confirmation was always solicited by the patriarchs themselves. Thus, to cite only a few examples in so clear a question, Anatolius, bishop of Constantinople, who certainly had not deserved well of the apostolic see, nay more, Fuzius himself, the first author of the Greek schism, solicited of the Roman pontiff the confirmation of their election, and employed for that purpose the intervention of the emperors Theodosius, Michael, and Basilius. So in the case of Maximus, bishop of Antioch, the fathers of Chalcedon, although they had declared null and void all the acts of the council, or rather the latrocinium of Ephesus, which had substituted that bishop for Domnus, yet resolved to place him in possession of the see for the reason that the holy and most holy pope who confirmed the episcopate of the holy and venerable Maximus bishop of Antioch 
showed by his just judgment that he approved his merit. 35. And as to the patriarchs of these churches who, having abjured schism, returned within recent dates into Catholic unity, you will not find any who did not request confirmation of the Roman pontiff. And the Roman pontiffs by their letters have confirmed them all, and have done it in such a way that, by the same act, they instituted them and placed them directly at the head of their churches. Now it has happened that, the Holy See tolerating the practice by reason of the remoteness of the countries, the perils of the journey, and the dangers in which the tyranny of the schismatics of the same rite often involved them, the patriarchs elect used to exercise their authority before receiving their confirmation by the sovereign pontiff, the same concession having been also made by dispensation in the West for the sake of convenience and of the necessity of the churches for those that were very remote. But it is proper to remark that these causes have now ceased to exist, for traveling is not attended with the same dangers as formerly, and Catholics, by the good will of His Highness the Ottoman Emperor, have been withdrawn from the civil authority of the schismatics. Now no one can fail to see that thus provision can be with more security made for the preservation of the faith than in times when a person unworthily elected to so great a charge could ascend the patriarchal throne and at his will trouble the church before having received apostolic confirmation. And certainly it is to be anticipated that causes of trouble may arise if the patriarch elect having been rejected by the apostolic see, should have to quit his seat. Thus, if the facts themselves be examined with even slight attention, it is seen that all that was settled by our constitution was for the conservation and extension of the faith, as well as for the true liberty of the church, and to secure the authority of the bishops whose rights and privileges being founded, supported, and fortified upon the stability of the apostolic see have always been at the prayer of the bishops, vigorously defended by the sovereign pontiff against heretics and ambitious men. 36. As to national rights, as they are called, we have no need to detain you long with our reply on that subject. For if the question is only about civil rights, those rights are attached to the power of the sovereign to decide about them in the manner that he shall judge to be most conducive to the welfare of his subjects. But if the expression be extended to mean ecclesiastical rights, no person can be ignorant that Catholics have never recognized in the Church, in her hierarchy or in her regulations, any of those national rights or rights of peoples. In effect, although nations and peoples from all parts of the world are brought together into the Church, God has so well united them in the unity of his name under the guidance of St. Peter, Prince of the Apostles and Supreme Pastor, whom he has placed at the head of all, that henceforward, as said the Apostle, there is neither Gentile nor Jew, barbarian nor Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Colossians 3.11 From whom the whole body of the church, being compacted and fitly joined together, by what every joint supplieth, according to the operation in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in charity. Ephesians 4.16 for the Lord not only has given to the nations and peoples no power whatsoever over the church, but by the commandment which he has caused them to believe, he has given the nations to the apostles that they should be taught. Therefore did St. Peter declare solemnly, in presence of the assembled apostles and ancients, that God had chosen him, and that by his mouth the ancients might receive the teaching of the gospel which they were to believe. 37. It is also said that the rights of His Imperial Highness have been violated by us. It is a gross calumny of which heretics have long made use. Invented first by the Jews against the Christ God, it was very often employed by the pagans in addressing the Roman emperors, and then by heretics in addressing even Catholic princes. And would to God that it were not still employed by them in the same manner. Therefore it was that St. Jerome wrote that, the heretics adulate the royal power, and so use it, that they may impute to kings their own pride, and in order that the king may seem to do what they are themselves doing. They accuse before him the soldiers and preachers of the faith, and order the teachers not to preach in Israel, lest they go against the will of the prince, because it is Bethel, 
that is to say the house of god and they contrive it so that the false church shall be reputed as the house of the kingdom and the king a holy thing these unblushing calumnies might be sufficiently refuted by contempt and by silence so utterly foreign are they to the doctrines of the catholic faith to our manners and our institutions but regard must be had to the simple and ignorant that they may not be so unhappy as to think wickedly of us and of the apostolic see by reason of the calumnies of the wicked who by the accusations which they lay upon others seek to themselves an excuse for their own vices thirty eight the doctrine of the catholic church received from god himself and handed down by the holy apostles is that we ought to render to caesar the things that are caesar's and to god the things that are god's and therefore our predecessors have never neglected whenever need arose to inculcate the fidelity and obedience due to princes accordingly even as the administration of civil matters belongs properly to the emperors so the affairs of religion concern the priests only in these affairs must be included everything necessary for the establishment and maintenance of the exterior discipline of the church for as our predecessor pius the sixth of venerable memory taught it is a heresy to assert that the use of this power received from god constitutes an abuse of ecclesiastical authority the apostolic see has always labored to maintain strictly unbroken this distinction of powers and all the holy pontiffs have openly blamed the interference of secular princes in things ecclesiastical an interference called by saint athanasius a new spectacle and an invention of the arian heresy it is sufficient to cite amongst them basil of caesarea gregory the theologian john chrysostom and john damascene this last declares plainly that no man shall persuade him that the church ought to be governed by the edicts of the emperors but that on the contrary she is ruled by the decrees of the fathers be they civil decrees or not therefore it is that the fathers of the ecumenical council of macedonia in the cause of Phocius, bishop of tyre proclaimed with equal plainness with the assent of the emperor's ministers themselves that against the rules no pragmatic that is no imperial edict shall prevail but that the canons of the fathers shall have all authority and at the enquiry of these same ministers whether the holy council passed this decree with reference to all the pragmatics made in prejudice of the canons all the bishops answered all the pragmatics are to cease the canons are to subsist and let this be done by you thirty nine there are two points in which it is asserted that the imperial rights have been violated by us namely as to our having regulated the mode of election and institution of the holy bishop and as to our having forbidden the patriarch to alienate ecclesiastical property without advice from the apostolic see forty but what is there that belongs more strictly to things ecclesiastical than the elections of bishops we nowhere read in the sacred writings that they were committed to the will of the prince or of the people while the fathers of the church the ecumenical councils and the apostolic constitutions have always recognized and decided that they appertain to the ecclesiastical authority if then in the question of the institution of a pastor of the church the apostolic see regulates the mode of election how can it be said that the rights of his imperial highness are violated his highness exercises his own power not the rights of another the authority of the holy bishops over the people committed to them is eminent and venerable but there is nothing in it which the civil government need fear because that government will have in it not an opponent but a supporter of the legitimate rights of the prince and if by reason of human weakness it should prove otherwise the apostolic see itself would make every effort to remove a bishop who should withdraw from the fidelity and submission due to his legitimate prince nor is there any reason to fear that an enemy of a legitimate prince should slip into a see for according to the church's law a long enquiry takes place previously as to those who are to be promoted that they may be ascertained to possess the virtues which the apostle requires in a bishop that man would not possess them who should be found not to be an observer of the command of blessed peter prince of the apostles be ye subject therefore to every human creature for god's sake 
whether it be to the king as excelling or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of the good for so is the will of god that by doing well you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not making liberty a cloak for malice but as the servants of god forty one and if as has seemed to the ottoman sovereign at constantinople and to his successors to be advantageous it be thought good also to entrust to the bishops and to other members of the clergy civil functions and a right of election it is not on that account that the full and entire power of the church in their election can suffer any diminution for it would be absurd that the things of heaven should be subordinated and subjected to the things of earth and the spiritual to the temporal besides that it would always be possible for his imperial highness if he thought proper to entrust to another the function of the civil power under the reserve for the catholic bishops of the free and full exercise of their ecclesiastical power it is quite well known that this has been done in other circumstances and especially by a special firman of the very exalted emperor of the turks in eighteen fifty seven forty two as all things have already been signified officially in our name and by our command to the sublime porta our venerable brother the bishop of thessalonica our legate extraordinary at constantinople it is evident right and proper to abstain from sifting over again these calumnies and trivial accusations unless it were desired to address those who are adversaries and care more for their party than for truth forty three but we have been greatly surprised to learn that on the occasion of the law established and confirmed by us on the subject of the sale of church property we not only meant to usurp imperial rights but even to claim for ourselves the property belonging to the armenian churches ecclesiastical property belongs as certainly to churches as civil property to citizens and it is not so much by the canons as by natural right itself that to every one is assured the possession of his own the administration of that property which in the early ages of the church was left to the discretion and conscience of the bishops has been by decrees of later councils regulated by laws determining the mode of management and the causes of lawful alienation whereby the ancient powers of bishops have been circumscribed and committed to the prudent judgment of the council or even of superior bishops but as it has appeared that sufficient provision had not been made for the safekeeping of church property either on account of the infrequency of councils or for some other reason the authority of the holy see has had to interfere and by it the regulation has been established that church property shall not be sold without the consent of the sovereign pontiff forty four this regulation was held to be of such weight and importance and so needful for their interest that it was long ago made a rule that newly elected bishops archbishops and even patriarchs should be bound under the obligation of an oath to observe this rule the oath has been taken even by patriarchs of the oriental rite in reference to the property of their mensa ever since their church returned back to the catholic truth and unity as documents preserved in our apostolic archives attest and there is not one of those patriarchs but has promised an oath to observe the aforesaid law the same has been and is done every day by the bishops of the latin rite in every country kingdom or republic without those powers ever making complaint that their rights were violated by the practice and in fact by these laws the sovereign pontiff usurps nothing arrogates nothing he simply makes a point either of deciding after enquiry and with regard to the advantage of the churches what a bishop ought to do in any particular case or of giving to the bishop himself the power of deciding as a father of a family would act with his children as to our having in our constitution extended to our other ecclesiastical brethren the rule already imposed upon patriarchs with regard to the property of their mensa not to put it up to sale without the assent of the apostolic see no man who judges reasonably will suppose that we acted without grave reasons of which we know that we must give account to god suffice it to know what every man of sense will without difficulty understand that so the safety of the churches and the safekeeping of church property has been more readily and effectively secured and that without prejudice to the lawful rights of any man our constitution aforesaid forty five 
how the rights of His Imperial Highness have been, as they say, violated by our decrees, we freely avow that we cannot in any wise understand. So far are we from having intended such a result. For, if it cannot be said that the power which the patriarchs and bishops enjoy, even in the Turkish Empire in the administration of church property, is prejudicial to those rights, no more can this be said of the power exercised, according to its duty and its right, by the apostolic see, in determining by its authority the mode in which sacred prelates ought to use such property, for edification and not for destruction. It is manifest that we have thus provided for the conservation of that property, and that this regulation will be most useful in the churches established in the East. When passions shall have calmed down, everyone will acknowledge it, and posterity, if these laws are strictly observed, will experience the advantage of them. And as the Sultan has by his decrees affirmed the liberty of these churches, and has signified to us that he exercises his patronage over them with great benignity, we doubt not that after serious examination of the facts, and rejection of the calumnies heaped up by adversaries, he will view rather with satisfaction than regret measures that must conduce to their manifest benefit. 46. No less calumnious is the objection recently imagined and maliciously accepted by the Oriental dissidents, who have actually treated the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Jesus Christ, as a foreign power, interfering in the exterior affairs of states and the governments of peoples, a thing, they say, that must be put a stop to once for all, in order that the rights of his imperial highness may be protected from invasion, and that every avenue must be closed up, so that other princes may not be encouraged to commit similar encroachments. 47. It is easy to understand how false and contrary to good sense and to the divine economy of the Catholic Church are all such suppositions. First, it is false that the Roman pontiffs have ever exceeded the limits of their power and interfered in the civil administration of states and that they have usurped the rights of princes. If the Roman pontiffs are exposed to this calumny, because they make regulations for the election of bishops and the sacred ministers of the church, and about the causes or other affairs which concern the ecclesiastical discipline called exterior, then of two things one. Either men ignore, or else they resist, the divine and immutable organization of the Catholic Church. It has ever been, and ever will remain, stable, and cannot be subject to change especially in those countries where the proper liberty and security of the Catholic Church has been assured by the decrees of the head of the state. In fact, as it is of faith that the Church is one, and that the Roman pontiff is her head and the father and teacher of all Christians, he cannot be called a foreigner to any Christians or to any of the particular churches of Christians, at least unless it be asserted that the head is foreign to the limbs, the father to the son, the master to the scholars, the shepherd to the flock. 48. Moreover, those who hesitate not to call the apostolic see a foreign power rend the unity of the church by that mode of speech, or furnish a pretext for schism, since they thereby deny to the successor of blessed Peter the rights of universal pastor and by consequence fail in the faith due to the Catholic Church if they are of the number of her sons, or they assail the liberty that is her due if they do not belong to her. For our Lord Jesus Christ has manifestly made it a duty for the sheep to know and hear the voice of the shepherd, and to follow it, and on the contrary to fly from the stranger, for they know not the voice of strangers. Confer John 10.5. If, then, the sovereign pontiff be reputed extern, that is, a stranger to any particular churches, that church will also be a stranger to the apostolic see and consequently to the Catholic Church, which is founded on the words of the Lord to Peter. They that separate from that foundation do not retain the divine and Catholic Church, but they are striving to make a human church, which, being held together only by the human tie of nationality, as they say, is not any longer bound together by means of its priests firmly attached to the see of Peter, and cannot share in its solidity, nor be any longer in the universally formed and indissoluble unity of the Catholic Church. 49. All these things, venerable brethren and dear sons, 
we have judged it fitting under the critical circumstances of the moment to write to you you who are sharers in the same faith with us in the justice of our god and saviour jesus christ in order to strengthen your uprightness of mind in the midst of this trouble for you are beholding amongst yourselves the accomplishment of that which the holy apostles of god long ago foretold namely that there should come in the last days men of deceit and of lies walking according to their own lusts watch then lest you be carried away in another gospel than that which has called you to the grace of christ and this other gospel is that of the contentious men who are troubling you and who wish to change the gospel of christ for they truly wish to change the gospel of christ they who strive to shake the foundation on which jesus christ has built his church and who deny or make vain the universal charge to feed the sheep and the lambs given to the blessed peter in the gospel in truth god permits and allows that these things should come to pass man's free will still remaining in order that when the peril of the truth proves your hearts and minds the unshaken faith of those who are tried may shine with a splendid light but you ought following the precept of the apostle to avoid those that advance daily in evil and not under any pretense to admit to your society those who communicate with such men as you have nobly and courageously done already so as to keep the catholic faith unsullied in your hearts fifty and let no man attempt to deceive you as was the practice of the ancient schismatics by pretending that it was not a question of religion but of morals or that the apostolic see was not dealing with the cause of communion and of the catholic church but was complaining of the private grievance of having seemed to be contemned by them for those that are in error never cease to spread such assertions and others like them to the end that they may deceive the simple for it is already manifest by their declarations and their published writings that it is the primacy of jurisdiction attached to this apostolic see in the person of blessed peter by our lord jesus christ which is openly attacked when the right of exercising it over the churches of the oriental rite is assailed our constitution aforesaid may have afforded the occasion or the pretext for turbulent or ignorant men to propagate their error but it is not the cause of it now the apostolic see in so grave an affair does not vituperate or reproach but defends the faith and the genuine communion in order that those who seem to resist it with scorn today it may if they return in a true spirit of penance to the integrity of the faith and catholic communion receive back in the plenitude of its charity if they shall have obeyed with their whole heart the paternal rules in use in such cases and to the end that the most merciful god may vouchsafe to grant us this grace which we have humbly asked of him so long in the lowliness of our heart we desire and we wish that you also would pray to this effect fifty one finally venerable brethren and dear sons strengthen yourselves in the lord and in the might of his strength take the armor of god that you may be able to stand in the evil day opposing to all adversities the shield of faith and counting not your life dearer than yourselves remember your forefathers who shrank not from encountering exile prison and death itself in order to keep for themselves and for us the true catholic faith for they well knew that those are not to be feared who kill the body but he who can cast both body and soul into hell cast then all your solicitude at god's feet for he careth for you and will not suffer that you be tempted beyond your strength but with the temptation will send help so that you may be able to resist then shall you rejoice in him although now you have to be a little sad on account of the various temptations that assail you but thus shall be made the trial of your faith which is much more precious than gold tried in the fire and it shall be accounted to you for praise and honor and glory in the day of the revelation of jesus christ in the name of the same god our saviour we entreat you that your words and your acts may be one that you may be perfect in the same heart and in the same mind being careful above all things to keep the unity of the faith in the bond of peace and may the peace of god which passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in christ jesus our lord in his name and by his authority we give you from our inmost heart to you venerable brethren and dear sons who persevere in the communion and obedience of this holy see our apostolic benediction 
given at Rome at St. Peter's, the sixth day of January of the year 1873, and of our pontificate, the 27th, Pope Pius the Ninth. End of encyclical letter Quartus Supra on the Church in Armenia by Pope Pius the Ninth. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C., Toulouse, France. Encyclical Letter, Etsi Multa, On the Church in Italy, Germany, and Switzerland, by Pope Pius IX. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pope Pius IX, Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolic Benediction. Although many grievous and bitter sufferings from the beginning of our long pontificate have fallen to our lot, through various causes which we have unfolded in our encyclical letters from time to time, yet in these last years the number of our sorrows has so increased that were we not upheld by the mercy of God, we should be almost overwhelmed by them. Of late, indeed, matters have reached such a pass that death itself seems better than life amid such storms, and with eyes lifted up to heaven we are fain to cry, It is better for us to die than to see the evils of the saints. Ever since our city of Rome, by the will of God, has been taken away by force of arms, and has passed under the sway of men who despise law, who are enemies of religion, who confound all things both human and divine, hardly a day has passed without inflicting some new wound on our heart, already suffering from repeated injuries and wrongs. There ring still in our ears the cries of religious men and women who have been driven from their homes in poverty and scattered hither and thither by hostile hands, as is done where revolution triumphs. Just as, according to Athanasius, the great Anthony used to say, the devil hates all Christians, but he cannot endure good monks and virgins dedicated to Christ. We have now seen what we thought could never come to pass, namely the suppression and abolition of the Roman university, which had been established, according to the words of an ancient author writing on the Anglo-Saxon school in Rome, that young church students from distant parts might be educated in Catholic faith and doctrine, lest in their own lands they should be wrongly taught, or in a way contrary to Catholic unity, and that they might go back strong and steadfast in the faith. Thus, while by foul means we are by degrees deprived of all ways of ruling and governing the universal church, it is clearly manifest how very far from the truth is that which has been asserted, namely, that the liberty of the Roman pontiff in the exercise of his spiritual ministry and in his relations with the Catholic world has been nowise diminished by the loss of our city. Nay, it becomes clearer every day how truly we have so often insisted that the sacrilegious usurpation of our territory has had for its especial object the subversion of the pontifical authority and the destruction, if possible, of the Catholic religion itself. It is not, however, the object of our letter to write to you on the woes of our city and of the whole of Italy. We would rather pass in silence over our own sorrows, if, by the mercy of God, we could assuage the bitter griefs which so many of our venerable brethren 
their clergy and people are undergoing in other lands. You are well aware, venerable brethren, that certain of the cantons of the Swiss Federation, not at the suggestion of non-Catholics, some of whom have condemned the act, but at the bidding of those busy members of secret societies who have now everywhere possessed themselves of power, have overturned the order and undermined the foundations of the Church of Christ, contrary to every rule of justice and in spite of their publicly pledged word. For according to solemn covenants, passed by the laws and authority of the Federation, the religious liberty of the Catholics ought to be maintained inviolate. In our allocution of the 23rd of December, 1872, we lamented the wrongs inflicted on religion by the governments of those cantons, both in making decrees concerning the doctrines of the Catholic faith in showing favor to apostates, and in forbidding the exercise of episcopal power. Our just complaints, made by our envoy before the Federal Council, were altogether overlooked, nor was greater regard shown to the repeated remonstrances of the bishops of Switzerland and of the Catholics of every class, and fresh wrongs put the last stroke to the injuries already inflicted. After the forcible banishment of our venerable brother Gaspar, Bishop of Hebron and Vicar Apostolic of Geneva, so glorious for the sufferer, and so disgraceful to those who put it into execution, the government of Geneva, on the 23rd of March and the 27th of August of this year, enacted two laws of the same tenor as the decree of October 1872, which was condemned by us in the allocution before mentioned. That government has claimed the right of reforming the constitution of the Catholic Church in the canton according to the radical pattern, and of subjecting the bishop to the civil power in the exercise of his proper jurisdiction and the administration and delegation of his authority to others, forbidding him to dwell in the canton, limiting the number and boundaries of the parishes, laying down the form and conditions of the election of parish priests and their assistants, and the manner of their resignation or suspension, assigning to laymen the right of nomination, and the temporal administration and inspection of ecclesiastical affairs generally. Moreover, parish priests and their assistants, without permission withdrawn at pleasure of the government, were forbidden to exercise their functions, to accept any dignities higher than that conferred upon them by the election of the people, and were also forced to take an oath in terms involving actual apostasy. It is clear that laws of this kind are not only null and void by reason of want of power in the lawmakers, as being laymen and non-Catholics, but also as regards their provisions that they are so contrary to the doctrines of the Catholic faith and to the ecclesiastical discipline enjoined by pontifical constitutions and the ecumenical council of Trent, that they ought to be altogether rejected by us. We, therefore, as required by our office, do, by our apostolic authority, solemnly reject and condemn them, declaring the required oath to be unlawful and sacrilegious, and that all those who in the canton of Geneva or elsewhere, having been elected according to the tenor of the same laws or others like them, by the votes of the people and confirmation of the civil power, shall venture to take upon them ecclesiastical functions, do ipso facto incur the greater excommunication 
especially reserved to this holy see and other canonical penalties, and that they are to be avoided by the faithful, according to the divine command, as strangers and robbers, who come not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. These are sad and sorrowful events, but deeds still more sorrowful have taken place in five of the seven cantons which form the diocese of Baal, namely Soleur, Bern, Baal Campagne, Argau, and Zurich. In those parts also laws have been enacted concerning parishes, the election and discharge of parish priests and their assistants, subversive of the government and divine constitution of the church, and subjecting the church to the secular and schismatical power. These laws, and especially the law of the 23rd of December, 1872, passed by the government of Soleur, we denounce and condemn, and order to be considered as so denounced and condemned. After our venerable brother Eugenius, Bishop of Baal, in his just indignation and apostolic fortitude had rejected certain articles, proposed in the meeting or so-called diocesan conference, to which there came delegates from the five aforesaid cantons, having a just reason for rejecting them, as injurious to episcopal authority, subversive of hierarchical government, and openly favorable to heresy, for this cause he was banished from his bishopric, expelled from his house, and violently driven into exile. No kind of wrong and injury was left undone to lead into schism the clergy and people of the five aforesaid cantons. The clergy were forbidden to hold any intercourse with their banished pastor. Orders were given to the cathedral chapter of Baal to proceed to the election of a vicar capitular or administrator, as if the see were actually vacant. The chapter, however, vigorously protested and spurned such unworthy action. In the meantime, by a decree of the civil magistrates of Bern, sixty-nine parish priests of the canton of Jura were forbidden to exercise their functions and deprived of their office, for the only reason that they had openly testified that they acknowledged only our venerable brother Eugenius as their lawful bishop and pastor, and would not treacherously sever themselves from Catholic unity. The consequence is that the whole of that district, which had constantly preserved the Catholic faith, and which had been united to the canton of Bern on the condition of keeping the exercise of religion free and inviolate, has been deprived of mass and the rites of baptism, marriage, and burial, in spite of the complaints and remonstrances of the faithful, by the highest injustice reduced to the necessity either of receiving schismatical and heretical pastors thrust upon them by civil authority, or of being deprived of all assistance and ministry of their priests. We thank God for upholding and strengthening, with the same grace that sustained the martyrs, that chosen part of the Catholic flock which manfully follows their bishop, setting up a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle in the day of the Lord, and without fear treading in the footsteps of the head of martyrs, Jesus Christ, meeting ferocious wolves with the meekness of lambs, and cheerfully and patiently fighting for the faith. This noble constancy of the faithful in Switzerland is imitated in a manner worthy of all praise by the clergy and faithful people of Germany, following the bright examples of their bishops. They have been made a spectacle to the world, 
to angels and to men, who from every side look up to them clad with the breastplate of Catholic truth and in the helmet of salvation, valiantly fighting the battle of God. Their courage and invincible fortitude is the more admired and praised, as day by day the persecution raised against them in Germany, and especially in Prussia, rages more and more bitterly. Beside many grievous wrongs inflicted last year upon the Catholic Church, the Prussian government has subjected to the civil power, by cruel and unjust legislation, altogether alien from its former conduct, the entire instruction and education of the clergy, in such manner that it belongs to the said power to inquire into and to decide in what manner church students are to be taught and trained to the sacerdotal and pastoral life, and, proceeding further, it gives to the same power the right of examining and judging in respect to collating to all ecclesiastical offices and benefices, and even of depriving sacred pastors of office and of benefice. Moreover, in order to subvert more speedily and completely the ecclesiastical government of the Church and the order of hierarchical obedience instituted by Christ our Lord himself, many obstacles are interposed by the same laws to hinder the bishops in providing with timely measures by canonical censures and pains for the salvation of souls for the soundness of doctrine in Catholic schools, or for the obedience due to them from their clergy. For according to the tenor of those laws, the bishops are not permitted to exercise these functions, save only at the pleasure of the civil authority and according to the rules laid down by the same. Finally, that nothing should be wanting to the entire suppression of the Catholic Church, a royal tribunal for ecclesiastical affairs has been instituted, before which bishops and sacred pastors may be cited, both by private men who are their subjects, and by public magistrates, there to receive judgment as criminals, and to be coerced in the exercise of their spiritual office. Thus the Holy Church of Christ to which the necessary and full liberty of religion had been guaranteed by the solemn and reiterated promises of princes, and by public pacts and conventions, is now in mourning in those regions, stripped of its every right, and exposed to hostile powers which threaten it with final destruction, for this new legislation reaches to the point of rendering the life of the church impossible. No wonder, therefore, that in that empire the former religious peace should be broken up by laws of this kind, and by the other councils and acts of the Prussian government full of hostility to the church. Wherefore, if any one would throw the blame of these perturbations on the Catholics of the German Empire, it would be altogether without warrant. For if it be imputed to them as an offence that they do not acquiesce in those laws, in which with a safe conscience they cannot acquiesce, for a like reason, and in like manner, the apostles and martyrs of Jesus Christ are to be accused who choose rather to undergo the most cruel punishment and death itself than betray their proper office and violate the laws of their most holy religion in obedience to impious commands of persecuting princes. Of a truth, venerable brothers, if no other laws than the laws of a civil empire existed, and laws indeed of a higher order which it is a duty to obey and sin to violate. If, moreover, these same civil laws could constitute a supreme rule of conscience, as some impiously and absurdly contend, 
the primitive martyrs, and they who afterwards followed them in shedding their blood for the faith of Christ and the liberty of the Church, would be rather worthy of blame than of honor and praise. Nay, it would not even have been possible, in the teeth of laws and against the will of princes, to preach and propagate the Christian religion and to found the Church. The faith, however, teaches, and human reason demonstrates, that there exists a twofold order of things, and at the same time two powers are to be distinguished on the earth, the one natural, which provides for the tranquillity of human society and secular affairs, the other, the origin of which is above nature, supreme over the city of God, that is, the Church of Christ, divinely instituted for the peace and the eternal salvation of souls. And the offices of twofold power are in wisdom ordained, that the things of God should be rendered to God, and that, in obedience to God, the things of Caesar should be rendered to Caesar, who is therefore great because he is less than heaven. For he himself belongs to him to whom belong the heavens and every creature. From this divine command the church assuredly has never turned aside, for it has always and everywhere labored to impress on the minds of the faithful the obedience which they ought inviolably to maintain towards sovereign princes and their laws in secular things. And it has taught with the apostle that princes are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil, commanding the faithful to be subject not only for wrath's sake, because the prince bears the sword as an avenger in wrath for him who does evil, but also for conscience' sake, because in his office he is the minister of God. This fear of princes the church itself restrains to evil deeds, and excludes it expressly from the observance of the divine law, being mindful of that which the blessed Peter taught to the faithful, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or a railer or a coveter of other men's goods. But if as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. Since these things are so, you will easily understand, venerable brothers, with what sorrow of mind we must have been affected when we read in a letter lately sent to us by the Emperor of Germany in person an accusation not less cruel than unlooked for against a part, as he himself says, of his Catholic subjects and especially against the Catholic clergy and bishops of Germany, of which accusation this is the cause that they, fearless of bonds and tribulations, and not counting their life more precious than themselves, have refused to obey the aforesaid laws, with the same constancy with which, before they were passed, they had protested by denouncing their injustice, which was unfolded in grave, luminous, and solid expostulations amidst the applause of the whole Catholic world, and of not a few even of non-Catholics, before the Sovereign, his ministers, and the supreme legislature of the kingdom. For that cause they are now accused as of the crime of treason, as of consenting and conspiring with those who are endeavoring to overthrow all orders in human society without regard to innumerable and notable proofs which evidently bear witness to their unshaken faith and allegiance to their sovereign, and their fervent patriotism towards their country. Yea, and we ourselves are asked to exhort those Catholics and sacred pastors 
to observe the aforesaid laws, which is to ask that we also ourselves should lend our help in oppressing and scattering the flock of Christ. But, trusting in God, we are confident that the Most Serene Emperor, when he has better ascertained and weighed these things, will reject a suspicion so empty and incredible against his faithful servants, and will no longer endure that their honor should be assailed by so foul a calumny, and that an unmerited persecution should be continued against them. We should indeed have gladly passed over in this place the letter of the emperor, if it had not been made public by the official journal in Berlin, altogether without our knowledge, and in a manner certainly unusual, together with another letter written by our hand, in which we appealed for the Catholic Church in Prussia to the justice of the Most Serene Emperor. The things which we have thus far recounted are before the eyes of all, wherefore, while religious and virgins dedicated to God are deprived of the common liberty of citizens and are exiled with cruel harshness, while public schools in which Catholic youth are educated are day by day further withdrawn from the wholesome teaching and vigilance of the Church, while societies founded for the nurturing of piety and even the seminaries of the clergy are dissolved, while the liberty of preaching the gospel is hindered, while it is prohibited in certain parts of the kingdom to teach the elements of religious education in the mother tongue, while the priests are forcibly taken away from the parishes over which they were set by the bishops, and the bishops themselves are deprived of their revenues, coerced by fines, and menaced by threats of imprisonments, while Catholics are disturbed by vexations of every kind, is it possible that we should receive into our mind that which is laid before us, namely that neither the religion of Jesus Christ nor the truth is called in question? nor is this the end of the wrongs which are inflicted upon the Catholic Church. For to this must be also added the patronage, which has been openly taken up by the Prussian and the other governments of the Germanic Empire, in behalf of those new heretics who call themselves old Catholics, by the abuse of the name, which would be truly ridiculous, if it were not that so many monstrous errors of that sect against the chief principles of the Catholic faith, so many sacrileges in divine worship and in the administration of sacraments, so many gravest scandals, so great a havoc of souls redeemed in the blood of Christ, did not rather draw abundant tears from our eyes. The attempts, indeed, and the aims of these unhappy sons of perdition appear plainly, both from other writings of theirs, and most of all from that impious and most impudent of documents, which has lately been published by him whom they have set up for themselves as their so-called bishop. For they deny and pervert the true authority of jurisdiction which is in the Roman pontiff and the bishops, the successors of the blessed Peter and the apostles, and transfer it to the populace, or, as they say, to the community. They stubbornly reject and assail the infallible teaching authority of the Roman pontiff and of the whole church, and, contrary to the Holy Spirit, who has been promised by Christ to abide in his church for ever, they audaciously affirm that the Roman pontiff and the whole of the bishops, priests, and people who are united with him in one faith and communion have fallen into heresy by sanctioning and professing the definitions of the Ecumenical Vatican Council. Therefore, they deny even the indefectibility of the Church, 
blasphemously saying that it has perished throughout the world and that its visible head and its bishops have fallen away, and that for this reason it has been necessary for them to restore the lawful episcopate in their pseudo-bishop, a man who, entering not by the gate, but coming up another way, has drawn upon his head the condemnation of Christ. Nevertheless, those unhappy men who would undermine the foundations of the Catholic religion and destroy its character and endowments, who have invented such shameful and manifold errors, or rather have collected them together from the old store of heretics, are not ashamed to call themselves Catholics, and old Catholics, while by their doctrine, their novelty, and their fewness, they give up all mark of antiquity and of Catholicity, truly with a stronger right against them than in former days by the mouth of St. Augustine against the Donatists, the Church, which is spread abroad among all nations, which Christ, the Son of the living God, has built upon the rock, against which the gates of hell shall not prevail, and with which he to whom all power has been given in heaven and upon earth has promised that he will remain all days to the end of the world, cries out to the eternal spouse, Why do those who have gone from me murmur against me? Why do those who are lost declare that it is I who have perished? Announce to me the fewness of my days. How long shall I be in this world? Tell it to me, for the sake of those who say that she was, and now she is not. For the sake of those who say that the scriptures have been fulfilled, the nations have believed, but the church has apostatized and perished from all the nations. And it was answered, nor was the voice an empty one. In what words was it announced? Behold, I am with you until the consummation of the world. That is, moved by your words and your false opinions, the church asks of God to make known to her the fewness of her days, and she finds that the Lord has said, Behold, I am with you until the consummation of the world. Here you will reason thus. Of us it is said that we are and shall be until the end of the world. Let Christ be asked. And this gospel, he says, shall be preached in the whole world in testimony to all nations, and then shall the end come. Therefore, until the end of the world is the church among all nations. May heretics perish. May they perish as they are, and be found to become what they are not. But these men, going on more boldly in the way of iniquity and perdition, as by a just judgment of God it happens to heretical sects, have wished also to form to themselves a hierarchy, as we have said, and have chosen and set up for themselves as their pseudo-bishop, a certain notorious apostate from the Catholic faith, Joseph Hubert Reinkins, and that nothing might be wanting to their impudence, for his consecration they have had recourse to those Jansenists of Utrecht, whom they themselves, before their falling away from the church, regarded with other Catholics as heretics and schismatics. Nevertheless, this Joseph Hubert dares to call himself a bishop, and, incredible as it may seem, the most serene emperor of Germany has, by a public decree, named and acknowledged him as a Catholic bishop, and exhibited him to all his subjects as one who is to be regarded as a lawful bishop and as such to be obeyed. But the very rudiments of Catholic teaching declare 
that no one can be held to be a lawful bishop who is not joined in communion of faith and charity to the rock on which the one church of Christ is built, who does not adhere to the supreme pastor to whom all the sheep of Christ are committed to be fed, who is not united to the confirmer of the brotherhood which is in the world. And indeed, to Peter did the Lord speak, to one, that he might by one establish unity. To Peter, the divine authority has given a great and wonderful share of his power, and if that authority has wished anything to be in common between him and other princes, it is only through him that it has been given. Hence it is that from this apostolic see, where the blessed Peter lives and presides, and dispenses the truth to all who seek it, the rights of holy fellowship extend to all. And it is certain that this same see is to the churches throughout the world as the head to the members, and that if any one cuts himself off from it, he becomes an outcast from the Christian religion, since he is not in the same bond of union. Hence the holy martyr Cyprian, speaking of the schismatical pseudo-bishop Novation, denied to him the very name of Christian, as being separated and cut off from the Church of Christ. Whoever he is and whatever he is, he is not a Christian who is not in the Church of Christ. Though he boast himself and talk of his wisdom and eloquence in proud language, he who has not retained either brotherly love or ecclesiastical unity has lost even what he before possessed, since the one church has been divided by Christ into many members throughout the whole world, and also one episcopate has been overspread therein by the manifold unity of many bishops. That man, in spite of the tradition of God, and in spite of the closely compacted unity of the church, is endeavoring to make the church human. He, therefore, who maintains neither the unity of the Spirit nor the brotherhood of peace, and severs himself from the bonds of the church and from the fellowship of the priesthood, can possess neither the power of a bishop nor the honor, unity, and peace of the episcopate. We, therefore, who have been placed undeserving as we are in the supreme see of Peter, for the guardianship of the Catholic faith, and for the maintenance of the unity of the universal church, according to the custom and example of our predecessors and their holy decrees, by the power given to us from on high, not only declare the election of the said Joseph Hubert Rankins to be contrary to the holy canons, unlawful and altogether null and void, and denounce and condemn his consecration as sacrilegious, but by the authority of Almighty God we declare the said Joseph Hubert together with those who have taken part in his election and sacrilegious consecration, and whoever adhere to and follow the same, giving aid, favor, or consent, excommunicated, under anathema, separated from the communion of the church, and to be reckoned among those whose fellowship has been forbidden to the faithful by the apostle, so that they are not so much as to say to them, God speed you. From these facts, to which we have referred in brief rather than at large, you are well assured, venerable brethren, how grave and full of danger is the condition of Catholics in those countries of Europe which we have mentioned. Neither are matters more favorable or the times more peaceful in South America, 
where some countries are so hostile to Catholics that their governments seem rather to deny in deeds than to profess the Catholic faith. There, for some years, bitter war has been stirred up against the Church and its institutions, and against the rights of this apostolic see. Matter would not be wanting were we to enlarge upon this subject. But since, on account of its grave nature, it cannot be lightly touched upon, we shall take another occasion to treat at length of it. Some of you may, perhaps, be surprised, venerable brethren, that the war which is carried on at this time against the Catholic Church extends so far and wide. But whoever is acquainted with the character, the aims, and purposes of the secret societies, be they Freemasons or by whatever name they are known, and compares them with the character and extent of the strife, which throughout nearly the whole world is waged against the Church, cannot hesitate to assign the cause of our present calamities to the craft and conspiracy of the same secret societies. From them is made up the synagogue of Satan, which is marshalling its forces and preparing to engage hand to hand against the Church of Christ. From their first beginnings they have been denounced to the kings and to the nations by our predecessors who have watched over Israel. Again and again have they condemned them, nor have we ourselves failed in this our duty. Would that the supreme pastors of the church had been more firmly believed by those who could have warded off so terrible a plague. But the secret societies, winding along by crooked ways, never ceasing their task, beguiling many with their cunning craft, are now bursting forth from their hiding places, and boasting themselves to be all-powerful. These sinful associations, having greatly increased the number of their adherents, fancy that they have now attained their ends and all but reached the goal set before them. Succeeding in this object, after which they have so long hankered, the possession of the chief power in many places, they are now boldly using the strength and power they have acquired that the Church of God may be reduced to the most grinding slavery, that it may be uptorn from its foundations and defaced in the divine marks with which it shines conspicuous. In a word, that, shaken, shattered, and overthrown by many blows, it may, if possible, be utterly blotted out from the world. Since these things are so, do you, venerable brothers, do your best to strengthen the faithful committed to your care against the snares and canker of these secret societies, and to save from destruction those who have unfortunately joined them? Do you especially disprove and show up the errors of those who from bad faith or through deceit do not shrink from asserting that these secret assemblies have for their only object social progress and advantage and the practice of mutual benevolence. Explain to them, and fix deeply in their minds, the pontifical decrees on this matter, and show that they refer not only to the Masonic societies in Europe, but to those that exist in America and throughout the countries of the world. To conclude, venerable brethren, since we have fallen on times not only of suffering, but of meriting much, let us take especial care, as good soldiers of Christ, not to despair, as in the midst of the storm we have a sure hope of future calm and a glorious peace for the Church, and trusting in the assistance of God, let us cheer ourselves, our toiling clergy, and our people, with the noble words of Chrysostom. 
Many waves and storms threaten us, but we are not afraid of being overwhelmed, for we stand upon the rock. Though the sea rage, it cannot melt the rock. Though the waves arise, yet they cannot sink the bark of Jesus. There is nothing mightier than the church. The church is stronger than heaven itself. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. What words are these? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you do not believe in words, believe in deeds. How many tyrants have tried to oppress the church? How many gridirons, how many furnaces, how many wild beasts, how many swords have been prepared against her? How much have they accomplished? Nothing. Where are her foes? They are forgotten. Where is the church? She shines more brightly than the sun. Her foes have perished. Her children are immortal. If, when there were few Christians, they were not overcome, how, when the whole world is full of holy religion, will you be able to overcome them? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Disturbed, therefore, by no danger and no fear, let us continue steadfast in prayer, and with one mind let us endeavor to appease the anger of heaven provoked by the sins of men, so that at last, in his mercy, the Almighty may arise and command the winds that they be still. Meanwhile, in testimony of our especial affection, we lovingly impart to you all, venerable brothers, to the clergy and all the people committed to your care, our apostolic blessing. Given at Rome, from St. Peter's, on the twenty-first day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1873, in the twenty-eighth year of our pontificate. Pope Pius IX. End of encyclical letter, Etsy Multa, on the Church in Italy, Germany, and Switzerland, by Pope Pius IX. Read by Patrick Randall. Encyclical letter, Victum a Nobis, on the Church in Austria, by Pope Pius IX. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Encyclical of Our Most Holy Father, Pius IX, to the Cardinals, Archbishops, and Bishops of the Austrian Empire. Dear Sons and Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolic Benediction. Scarcely had we, in our letter of the 24th of November, in last year, announced to the Catholic world the grievous persecution which had been commenced against the Church in Prussia and in Switzerland, when a fresh trouble was prepared for us by the news of other wrongs threatening the Church, which, like her divine spouse, may every day breathe forth that complaint, ye have added yet more to the pain of my wounds. And these wrongs trouble us all the more, inasmuch as they are inflicted by the government of the Austrian nation, which, during the great epochs of Christian states, contended valorously for the Catholic faith in the closest alliance with this holy see. It is true that, a few years hence, there were issued, in that monarchy, decrees in contradiction with the most sacred rites of the Church, and with treaties solemnly concluded, decrees which we, in conformity with our duty, had to condemn and declare to be null and void, as we did in our allocution of June the 22nd, 1868, addressed to our venerable brothers, the Cardinals of the Holy Roman Church. But today, there are presented for the approbation of the Reichsrat, 
new laws tending openly to bring the Catholic Church into most pernicious slavery to the arbitrary will of the secular power, contrary to the divine ordinance of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Creator and Redeemer of the human race assuredly founded his Church as a visible kingdom on earth, and he not only endowed it with the supernatural gift of an infallible teaching for the propagation of holy doctrine, and with the priesthood for the divine service and sanctification of souls by the sacrifice and the sacraments, but he also gave to it a proper and plenary power to legislate, to judge, and to exercise a salutary constraint in all things which stand in relation to the real aim and end of the kingdom of God upon earth. Now, forasmuch as this supernatural power of ecclesiastical government, being based on the ordinance of Jesus Christ, is equally distinct from and independent of the secular dominion, this kingdom of God on earth is a kingdom of a perfect society, self-regulating and self-governing, according to its own laws and its own jurisprudence, by its own rulers, who watch to render an account of souls, not to the secular sovereign, but to the Prince of Pastors, Jesus Christ. He instituted the pastors and teachers, and they, in their spiritual charge, are not subject to any secular authority. Therefore the sacred rulers are in duty bound to rule, and therefore it is the laity's duty, according to the precept of the Apostle, to obey them and to be subject to them. And therefore the Catholic people have the sacred right not to be impeded by the civil government in the exercise of that their divinely ordered and sacred duty of obeying the Church's doctrine, discipline, and laws. Dear sons and venerable brothers, you recognize with us that the text of the laws now under consideration in the Reichsrat of Austria involves and exhibits a grave violation of that divine constitution of the Church and an intolerable subversion of the rights of the Apostolic See, of the Holy Canons, and of all Catholic people. In fact, by virtue of these laws, the Church of Christ, in almost all her relations with, and acts in reference to, the faithful, is judged and considered as in complete subordination and subjection to the superior authority of the secular power. And this is openly stated, and, so to speak, asserted as a principle in the preamble in which the object and intention of the new laws is set forth. It is also expressly declared that the secular government, in virtue of its unlimited power, possesses the right of making laws as well upon ecclesiastical as upon secular questions, and of watching and ruling over the Church as over all the mere human societies that exist within the Empire. Accordingly, the secular government arrogates to itself the right of judging and teaching above the constitution and rights of the Catholic Church and above her high superior direction, and it exercises the same partly by its laws and by its acts, and partly by different ecclesiastical persons. From thence it follows that the will and power of the civil government take the place of the religious authority established by divine ordinance for the direction of the Church and the edification of the body of Christ. Against such usurpation of the sanctuary, the great St. Ambrose has well said, They tell us that Caesar can do all things, and that everything appertains to him. But go not so far as to imagine that thou possessest imperial rights over that which is consecrated to God. Exalt not thyself, but submit thyself to God. It is written, that which is God's belongeth unto God, and that which is Caesar's to Caesar. To the emperor belong the palaces, to the priest the churches. Moreover, as to these new laws, and the preamble of grounds for their enactment, they are, in truth, of the same nature and the same character as the Prussian laws, and they are pregnant with the same evils to the church Catholic in the Austrian Empire, although at first sight they may appear moderate as compared with the Prussian laws. We do not mean to examine each article of these laws in detail, but we can by no means pass over in silence the cruel offence already offered to us and to this apostolic see, as also to yourselves, dearly beloved sons and venerable brothers, and to the whole Catholic people of that empire 
by the presentation of such laws. The Concordat, concluded in the year 1855, between us and the illustrious Emperor, confirmed by that same Catholic monarch with a solemn promise, and promulgated throughout the whole empire as a law of the empire, is now brought before the Chamber of Deputies with a declaration that it is completely invalidated and annulled without any previous negotiation with the Apostolic See, nay, more with public slight of our most just representations. Would they ever have dared publicly to do such a thing in those days when the faith was held in esteem? But now, at this sad epoch, men undertake and men carry into execution. Once more, well-beloved sons and venerable brothers, do we protest before you against this public violation of the Concordat. And we do the more severely blame this outrage committed against the Church, inasmuch as it is the definition of the teachings of the faith, as published and confirmed by the Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, that is insidiously put forward as the cause and the pretext of the breaking of the Concordat and of the other laws connected therewith. Those Catholic dogmas are impiously styled novelties and changes in the Articles of the Faith and in the Constitution of the Church. There may be a few persons in the Austrian Empire who reject the Catholic faith for these unworthy inventions, but the illustrious monarch of that empire, with the whole of the imperial family, hold and profess it. The immense majority of the people hold and profess it, and it is on such a people that laws are about to be imposed which are based on inventions such as these. Thus, without our knowledge or consent, the conventions which we had concluded with the most noble emperor, in the interest of the salvation of souls and for the advantage of the state, has been torn up. A new form of right has been put forward as a pretext, and a new power has been conferred on the civil government in order to authorise it to put its hand on things ecclesiastical, and to order and arrange the affairs of the Church at its own discretion. With these projected laws, the way is now open to bind with heavy chains and to paralyse the inviolable liberty of the Church in the tenure and administration of her property for the salvation of souls, for the government of the faithful, for the religious direction of the laity and of the clergy, for the promotion of Christian life towards evangelical perfection. Perversion of discipline is being introduced. Favour is shown to apostasy. Sects are encouraged to unite and conspire under the protection and safeguard of the laws against the true doctrines of Christianity. In reality, a great task would be incumbent upon us were we to undertake to mention the nature and number of the evils which are to be apprehended so soon as these laws shall come into force. But, dear sons and venerable brothers, it is impossible that they can deceive you or elude your sagacity, for almost all functions and benefices ecclesiastical, and even the discharge of pastoral duties, are hereby placed in such subjection to the secular government that the prelates of the church, supposing that they submit themselves to these new regulations, which is far from being possible, would no longer be able to administer according to the salutary regulations of the Church those dioceses for which they must render a strict account to God, but they would be compelled to discharge those duties and even to retain them at the dictation and arbitrary will of those who are at the head of the State. Furthermore, what can be expected of those projects of law which are entitled Touching Religious Communities? Their fatal bearing in their hostile intent are so evident that no one can misapprehend the truth that they are contrived and framed for the destruction and ruin of the religious orders. Finally, the danger threatening the total loss of their property is so great as to be scarcely distinguishable from a public sale and squandering. Notably, the government will place all that landed property at its own disposal, according to the regulations of the new Act and will assume the right and power of partitioning the said property, letting it on lease, and paring it down by taxation, until a miserable income and benefit remaining from it to the religious, will be with reason regarded not as an honour to the church, but as a cloak to cover robbery and wrong. Dear sons and venerable brethren, 
as the laws which the Chamber of Deputies of the Austrian Reichsrat is now discussing are framed with the intent and based on the principles which we have now stated, you doubtless see clearly the dangers that now threaten the flock entrusted to your watchfulness. Evidently, the unity and peace of the church are placed in hazard, and men are striving to wrest from the church that liberty which St. Thomas of Canterbury well called the soul of the church, without which she has no strength against those who endeavour to usurp the possession of the sanctuary of God. This expression has been explained by another invincible defender of the same liberty, St. Anselm, in the following terms. God loves nothing in this world so much as the liberty of the church. Let those who would rather tyrannise over the church than serve her consider themselves as without doubt the enemies of God. God wills his spouse to be free and not in servitude. This is why we stir up and enkindle your pastoral vigilance and the zeal with which you are animated for the house of the Lord, in order that you may struggle to escape the danger that is approaching you. Take great courage to sustain the conflict in a manner worthy of your virtue. We, on our part, are assured that you will not do less, either in courage or in energy, than those honoured brethren who elsewhere, amidst the most bitter persecution, have become, in the midst of obloquy and persecution, a spectacle, while they endure with joy for the church's liberty, not only the spoiling of their goods, but even in bonds sustain the conflict of suffering. Finally, all our hopes are placed in God, not in our own strength. The cause at stake is the cause of God, who by his word, that cannot fail, has given us that warning and instruction. In the world ye shall have persecutions, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We then, who in virtue of our apostolic charge, in which the grace of God strengthens our weakness, have been placed in the post of leader during this war now waged against the church, a bitter war, and one full of sad incidents, we say and quote to ourselves what St. Thomas of Canterbury long ago expressed in the following terms, which suit admirably our own days and our own dangers. The conflict which the enemies of God wage against us is a conflict between them and God. Let us, therefore, desire of them nothing else than that which the eternal God, when he became flesh for his church, left to her in his everlasting covenant. Lift up yourselves, then, with us in faith and in the love of Christ for the protection of the church, and with the authority and wisdom with which you are endowed, come to the assistance of mankind, for no earthly good can be sufficient for them so long as the church of God enjoys not her liberty. We have the more confidence in you inasmuch as the cause at stake is the cause of God. As far as concerns ourselves, be assured that we very much prefer to suffer temporal death than to put on the badges of a sorrowful servitude. The issue of this conflict has this significance for posterity, that the church is ever afflicted? No, God preserve her from that, but that she ever rejoices in her own liberty. But, as you have to bend all your efforts to anticipate, by your authority, your wisdom, and your zeal, the dangers that threaten you, you will recognize that nothing could be more opportune and more useful than to deliberate in common counsel what are the best means of attaining, most certainly and most effectually, the desired object. So long as men attack the church's rights, it is our duty to protect the faithful. But the wall of defense will be so much the more secure, and the defense itself so much the more powerful, as your efforts shall be more unanimous and more adapted to the end, and as the measures demanded by the situation shall be framed and carried out with greater zeal. That is why we exhort you to meet as soon as possible, and after deliberation in common, to fix on a line of conduct decided and approved by all, such as may enable you, conformably with your official duty, to combat with common accord the evils that threaten and energetically defend the liberty of the Church. Our exhortation is necessary in order that we may not appear to have neglected our duty in a question of such importance, for well, we are convinced 
that even without such exhortation you would have discharged your duty. Also, we have not yet resigned the hope that God will turn away the existing evils. That which encourages this hope is the devotion and faith of our well-beloved Son in Christ, the Emperor and King, Francis Joseph, whom we have earnestly adjured in our new letter of this day, never to tolerate in his vast empire that the church should be subjected to an ignominious enslavement and his Catholic subjects to the greatest of afflictions. But as the number of the church's assailants is great and every assault is eminently dangerous, you can at least persevere calmly. May God vouchsafe to guide your decisions and support you by his powerful protection to the end that you may be able happily to resolve on and to carry into operation all that conduces to the glory of his name and the salvation of souls. As the sign of that divine protection and of our special good will, we affectionately accord to all and to each of you, dear sons and venerable brothers, as also to the clergy and faithful entrusted to your vigilance, our apostolic benediction. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, this seventh day of March, in the year 1874, in the twenty-eighth year of our pontificate. Pope Pius the Ninth. End of encyclical letter Vix Dum Anobis on the Church in Austria by Pope Pius the Ninth. Recording by Algie Pug. Encyclical letter Omnem Solicitudinem on the Greek Ruthenian Rite by Pope Pius the Ninth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Encyclical of the Holy Father on the Affairs of Poland and Russia To our venerable brothers, Josef Sembratovich, Archbishop of Leopold, Halies, and Kamenz, of the Ruthenian Rite, and to the other bishops of the same rite, being in grace and communion with the Apostolic See, Pius Pope the Ninth. Venerable Brothers, Health and Apostolical Benediction From the very first years of our long pontificate, we have exerted our solicitude and all our efforts to promote the spiritual welfare of the Oriental Churches, and we have solemnly declared that the particular Catholic liturgies ought to be religiously preserved and retained in their full integrity, and also that they have been held in high esteem by our predecessors. We have, in fact, as proof of this, the remarkable teachings given by Clement VIII in his constitution Magnus Dominus of the year 1595 and by Paul V in his brief of December 10, 1615, and above all, to mention no others, by Benedict XIV in his encyclical letters the Mandatam of the year 1743, and the Late Sunt of the year 1755. Now, as there has ever existed a most intimate connection and union between liturgical discipline and dogmatic doctrine, therefore it is that the Holy See, as infallible teacher of the faith and wise guardian of the truth, whenever it perceived any dangerous or unbeseeming right to have crept into the Oriental Church, has at once condemned such right and prohibited its use. On the other hand, the care with which, as we have said, we have preserved the ancient liturgies has been no hindrance to certain rites being borrowed from other churches and adopted amongst those of the Oriental Church. Of such rites, Gregory the Sixteenth of Happy Memory wrote to the Catholic Armenians, Your ancestors loved them, either because they thought them fitting and beautiful, or they adopted them at various periods as a mark of distinction between themselves and the heretics and schismatics. Therefore, as the same sovereign pontiff teaches, it is necessary strictly to observe the rule which enjoins that, except for very grave reasons and such as have been approved by the Holy See, no innovation should ever be made in the rites of the sacred liturgy without consulting the Holy See not even under pretext of re-establishing ceremonies that may appear more in conformity with the liturgies approved by the same see. Now, these principles of law have been wisely prescribed for all the churches of the Oriental Rite. 
And as has been declared several times on occasion, especially in the before-mentioned brief of Paul V, they form the rule of the liturgical discipline of the Ruthenians, whom the Roman pontiffs have always dealt with in a particular spirit of benevolence, and on whom they have heaped especial favors. And no sooner has it become apparent that any danger threatened them, and that their faith was exposed to grave peril, than the apostolic see failed not to raise its voice without a moment's delay in order to avert so great a calamity. Still sounding in our ears are the words of our predecessor Gregory the Sixteenth of happy memory, uttered by him at a time when the Ruthenian nation was, as everyone knows, in a most calamitous state, in consequence of which we have this day to deplore the fact of about three hundred thousand of these same Ruthenians being driven from the pale of the Catholic Church. The aid of this apostolic see was not withheld from the Ruthenian nation when long and grave controversies were agitated, not without detriment to Christian charity, in the ecclesiastical province of Leopold, on account of the diversity of discipline and of rank, and on account of the mutual relations existing between the ecclesiastics of the Latin rite and those of the Greek rite. Controversies which, by means of a convention or agreement proposed by the bishops of each rite, and sanctioned by a decree of the Sacred Congregation of Propaganda for Oriental Affairs, dated 6 October 1863, were happily smoothed over and suppressed. But the sad state of things in which the same province, and particularly the neighboring countries to the Diocese of Kelm, are at present, now claims once more all our vigilance and all our solicitude. In effect, it has been reported to us that a miserable controversy has been raised. With rash boldness about liturgical matters amongst the Catholic of the Greco-Ruthenian rite, and that certain personages, notwithstanding the clerical orders with which they were invested, have attached themselves to her doctrines and presumed to dictate, and, in accordance with their own caprice to reform, the sacred ceremonies, of which some were rightfully received by immemorial usage, and the others solemnly ratified by the sanction of the Council of Zamosk, which received the approbation of the Apostolic See. But what afflicts us most and causes the deepest grief to our heart is that which we have learned of the sad state of things now oppressing the diocese of Calm. In effect, the bishop of that diocese, whom we instituted but a few years since, and who is still connected with that diocese by the spiritual tie, is gone. And a certain pseudo-administrator, whom we long since adjudged unworthy of the episcopal dignity, has not feared to usurp ecclesiastical jurisdiction, and to overturn everything within that church, and above all, to confuse and disturb of his own authority, the liturgy canonically approved. Filled with sadness, we have still before our eyes the circular letter of the 20th October, 1873, by which that unhappy pseudo-administrator dares to make innovations in the performance of divine service and in the sacred liturgy, doubtless for the purpose of introducing the liturgy of the schismatics into the Catholic diocese of Kelm, the better to impose upon the simple and ignorant and the more easily to lead them into schism, the said pseudo-administrator is not ashamed to support his cause by quoting certain constitutions of the apostolic see, and fraudulently to abuse their ordinances which he interprets erroneously in his own sense. Now, no one can fail to see that all the rules laid down as to liturgical matters in the aforesaid circular letter are holy, null, and void, and we ourselves do, by virtue of our apostolic authority, declare them so to be. In effect, the aforesaid pseudo-administrator is wholly and entirely destitute of any ecclesiastical authority whatsoever, inasmuch as neither the lawful bishop, before his departure from the diocese, nor, subsequently, the apostolic see, ever conferred any such authority upon him. It is therefore certain and evident to all men that he entered not into the sheepfold by the door, but by some other way, and that he ought, consequently, to be regarded as an intruder. It is true that the sacred canons of the Church ordained that the ancient Oriental rites lawfully introduced should be retained, because our predecessors, the Roman pontiffs, have thought it proper after mature examination to approve or to permit those rites, in so far as they are not contrary to the Catholic faith, imperil not the salvation of souls, nor derogate from ecclesiastical dignity. But at the same time, these very canons solemnly declare that it is not permitted to any person of his own accord 
and without previously consulting the Holy See, to put in practice even the slightest changes in liturgical matters. And this is abundantly proved by the apostolic constitutions herein before cited. And it is an argument devoid of any force to pretend, as has in this matter been done for the purpose of imposing, that these various liturgical innovations have been attempted in order to purify the Oriental Rite, and to bring it back to its pristine integrity. For, in effect, the liturgy of the Ruthenians cannot be any other than that which was either instituted by the Holy Fathers of the Church, or sanctioned by the canons of councils, or introduced by lawful usage, always with the approbation, express or tacit, of the apostolic see. And if, in the course of time, some variations may have occurred in the said liturgy, they assuredly were not introduced without the Roman pontiffs being consulted. And they were, above all, intended to deliver these rites from every defilement of heresy or of schism, and thus to give expression to the Catholic dogmas with more exactness and clearness, and so secure the integrity of the faith and promote the good of souls. Therefore it is that under the treacherous pretext of purifying the rites and bringing them back to their integrity, no other end was really sought than to lay snares for the faith of the Ruthenians of Count whom men of perdition are striving to force from the pale of the Catholic Church and to deliver over to heresy and schism. Nevertheless, amidst all the severe afflictions from every quarter which press upon us, one thing sustains us and rejoices us. It is the remarkable and most heroic spectacle lately given before God, before angels and before men, by the Ruthenians of the Diocese of Calm when they refused obedience to the iniquitous orders of the pseudo-administrator, and preferred to endure all sorts of evils, and even to encounter loss of life itself, rather than to sacrifice the faith of their fathers, and to abandon the rights which they had received from their ancestors, and which they had resolutely declared they would preserve intact and entire. As for ourselves, we do not cease, by all kinds of supplication, to implore God that he, who is rich in mercy, would, in his great goodness, cause the light of his grace to penetrate the hearts of all who, contrary to all justice, now afflict the diocese of Cam, and that he would, at the same time, grant his powerful protection to the afflicted but faithful Catholics, who are now bereft of all spiritual aid and direction, and that he would hasten the coming of that happy time when much desired peace shall be restored. And as for you, venerable brethren, who with so much earnestness and such signal zeal have accepted the pastoral charge confided to you of the Ruthenians, we do, thereupon, earnestly exhort you in the Lord that you would religiously preserve the liturgical discipline approved by the Apostolic See, or introduced after the same See had been informed of it, and had made no objection thereto. We enjoin you wholly to interdict all innovation, and not to omit to recommend to parish and other priests, even under pain of the severest penalties, should you deem it necessary. The exact observance of the sacred canons concerning this matter, and especially those of the Synod of Zamosk. There is, in effect, an important question at stake, the salvation of souls, for the unlawful innovations are causing the greatest peril to the Catholic Ruthenians in their faith and in their religious unity. You ought, therefore, to spare no care or pains, and never to desist from trying by all means to quell completely, the moment they make their appearance, all the troubles which depraved men have stirred up in those parts in regard to liturgical matters. And we have confidence that, by the help of God's grace, you will in no wise fail to accomplish those duties with energy, and at the same time with gentleness. And in order that it may so come happily to pass, we do very affectionately grant you, in the Lord, our apostolic benediction, for yourselves, venerable brethren, and for the flock which each of you has in his charge. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, this 13th of May, 1874, in the 28th year of our pontificate, Pius Pope the Ninth. End of Encyclical Letter Omnem Solicitudinem on the Greek Ruthenian Rite by Pope Pius IX. Read by Maria Angela Aragon.
encyclical letter Gravibus Ecclesiae, the Jubilee of 1875, by Pope Pius IX. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Jubilee of 1875 Encyclical of Our Most Holy Lord Pius the Ninth by Divine Providence Pope To all patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and to all ordinaries of places, having favor and communion with the apostolic see, and to all the faithful of Jesus Christ. Pope Pius the Ninth, Venerable Brothers and Dear Sons, Health and Apostolic Benediction. Gathering resolution from the great troubles of the Church, and from the great evils of the age, and from the need there is of imploring the help of God, we have never throughout the course of our pontificate omitted to stir up Christian people to appease the Divine Majesty and to obtain the mercy of heaven by holiness of life, by works of penance, and by the devout offering up of supplications. To this end, we have on many different occasions, and with apostolic bounty, opened to the faithful the spiritual treasury of indulgences, in order that with true penance and souls purified by means of the sacrament of reconciliation and cleansing of the stains of sin, they might with greater confidence approach the throne of grace and make themselves worthy of having their prayers accepted by God. Amongst other circumstances, we desired above all things that on the occasion of the Holy Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, that important work should be so undertaken as to conduce to the benefit of the universal Church, and should be assisted before God by the prayers of the whole Church. And although the celebration of the Council has been suspended through the troubles of the time, we did nevertheless, for the good of the faithful, ordain and decree that the indulgence then published in the form of a jubilee should remain in force, validity, and continuance so long as the Council should last. But the course of these unhappy times goes on and we are now at the year 1875, the year which marks the end of the sacred period, which, by the pious custom of our forefathers and by the decrees of the Roman pontiffs, has been devoted to the celebration of the solemnity of a universal jubilee. With what respect and religious devotion the jubilee was observed in the peaceful days of the Church, when its regular celebration was allowed, the monuments of history, ancient and modern, can attest. It was, in fact, always regarded by all Christian people as a year of salvation and of expiation, as a year of grace and redemption, of pardon and indulgence, during which men resorted from all parts of the world to our city, to the Sea of Peter, where the most abundant benefits of reconciliation and of grace were offered to all the faithful for the salvation of their souls, and they were invited to the practice of the duties of piety. Even in the present century has been witnessed this pious and holy solemnity. A jubilee was proclaimed by our predecessor, Leo XII of happy memory, in the year 1825, and the benefit was accepted with such ardent zeal by all Christian people that the same pontiff was enabled to rejoice at the incessant concourse of pilgrims during the entire year to this city, and at the admirable splendor of religion, 
of piety, of faith, of charity, and of all the virtues which shone forth therein. Would to God that in this day our own condition and the state of civil and religious affairs would allow us happily to celebrate at least this once with ancient rite and according to the custom of our ancestors this solemnity of the great jubilee which became due in the year eighteen fifty of our century and which we were then obliged on account of the affliction of the time to omit but it has pleased god to permit that those great difficulties by which we were prevented from publishing the jubilee so far from having vanished have increased from day to day nevertheless considering all the evils with which the church is afflicted all the efforts made by her enemies to snatch from souls their faith to corrupt sound doctrine and to spread the poison of impiety considering the many scandals caused in all places to believers in jesus christ considering the general corruption of morals and the sad overthrow of all rights both human and divine an overthrow both widely spread and abounding in ruins which goes to destroy in the mind of man even the sense of right and reflecting as we do that under this great accumulation of evils it becomes more than ever our apostolic duty to take care that faith religion and piety are made strong and prosperous and that the spirit of prayer is extended and increased to the end that such as fall away may be stirred up to penitence of heart and reformation of manners and that the sins which have drawn down god's anger may be redeemed by works of holiness which is chiefly the fruit of the celebration of the great jubilee we therefore have judged that we ought not to suffer christian people under present circumstances at least in so far as the condition of the time would allow to be deprived of so salutary a benefit by means of which their souls might be strengthened and they might then go forward with ever increasing zeal in the path of justice might be cleansed from their faults and might with more and more profit to themselves obtain the favor and pardon of god let then the whole church militant of jesus christ receive the words in which with a view to her own exaltation and the sanctification of christian people and to the glory of god we decree proclaim and publish the great and general jubilee for the whole of the year eighteen seventy five now ensuing and by reason of this jubilee we of our own free will and that of the holy see do suspend and declare to be suspended the indulgence above mentioned which was granted in form of jubilee on the occasion of the vatican council and we open wide the heavenly treasure formed of the merits of the sufferings and of the virtues of jesus christ our lord and of his virgin mother and of all the saints which the author of men's salvation has committed to our stewardship wherefore trusting in the mercy of god and in the authority of his apostles blessed peter and paul and in virtue of the supreme power of binding and loosing which notwithstanding our unworthiness god has committed to us we do concede and grant mercifully in the lord faculty of gaining once in the year the aforesaid plenary indulgence of the year of jubilee with the remission and pardon of all their sins to all the faithful of jesus christ 
and to each one of them, as well as to those who dwell in our mother city, or who come there, as also to those who reside out of this city, to whatsoever part of the world they may belong, and who live in the favor and obedience of the apostolic see, provided that, being truly penitent, having confessed their sins, and being strengthened by the Holy Communion, those resident in this city do visit, at least once each day, during fifteen days, either consecutively or at intervals, being either natural days or ecclesiastical days, that is to say, from the first vespers of one day to the twilight of the following. The basilicas of St. Peter, St. Paul, St. John Lateran, and St. Mary Major, and that those resident out of Rome shall similarly visit, during fifteen days, either consecutive or non-consecutive days, as above mentioned, the cathedral or greater church, and three other churches, of the same city or place, or of its suburbs, which shall be appointed for that purpose by the ordinaries of those places, or by their vicars or other representatives, so soon as these our letters apostolic shall have been brought to their knowledge, and there shall piously pour forth their prayers for the prosperity and exaltation of the Catholic Church and of this apostolic see, for the extirpation of heresies and for the conversion of all sinners, for the peace and unity of all Christian people, and for our intention. And we hereby permit that this indulgence be applicable by way of suffrage to the souls which, being united to God by charity, shall have departed this life, and that it be available for them. Travelers by land and by sea, as soon as they shall have reached their home or shall have stopped at any other place, may validly gain the said indulgence according to the conditions prescribed above, and by visiting the requisite number of times the cathedral or greater church or the parish church of their home or stopping place. And we do, by the tenor of these presents, also grant and permit the aforesaid ordinaries of each place to dispense with the prescribed visits in the case of consecrated religious women and young girls and other women cloistered in convents or living in other houses of piety or in religious communities, also to anchorites and hermits and all other laymen and ecclesiastics as well secular as regular, confined in prison or prevented by bodily infirmity or by any other cause from performing the visits in the manner prescribed, and also to dispense with communion in the case of children not yet admitted to their first communion. And instead of those visits and of that sacramental communion, to prescribe for such persons respectively, either by themselves or by the regular heads or superiors of those persons of either sex, or by prudent confessors, other works of piety, charity, and religion. Moreover, to chapters and congregations, as well of seculars as of regulars, to sodalities, confraternities, universities, or colleges of whatever kind, the members of which shall visit such churches processionally, we do in like manner, by the tenor of these presents, concede and indulge that they may and can, according to their own prudent discretion, reduce those visits to a lesser number. And moreover, to the said nuns and to their novices, we do grant license and faculty of confessing for the purpose aforesaid 
to such confessor as they themselves may prefer, amongst those approved by the ordinary of the place where their convents are established, and appointed to receive the confessions of nuns, and to all others of the faithful of either sex, as well lay people as secular ecclesiastics, and to the religious of every order, congregation, and institute whatsoever, we do concede license and faculty that they may, for the purpose aforesaid, choose to themselves any priest as confessor, either a secular or a regular, of any, even of a different, order and institute, so that he may be a person whom the actual ordinaries, in whose cities, dioceses, and territories such confessions are to be heard, shall have similarly approved for the purpose of hearing the confessions of lay persons. And with the same authority and the same bounty of apostolic liberality, we grant and concede to those confessors within the said space of the year, on behalf of all those persons of both sexes who sincerely and seriously intend to gain this present jubilee, and with that intention come to confession in order to fulfill the other necessary conditions, the power and authority to absolve pro hoc vice and in foro conscientiae, only imposing on them a salutary penance and the other requisite conditions, from excommunication and from suspension, and from other ecclesiastical sentences, and from all censures, whether canonically incurred, or actually pronounced and inflicted by the judge, for any cause whatsoever, even in the cases reserved to the ordinaries of places, and to us, or to the apostolic see, and also cases by special form reserved to certain authorities, and to the sovereign pontiff, or to the apostolic see, and not understood as included in other grants, how large soever they may have been. As also, all sins and transgressions, however heinous, and of however great enormity, even those reserved to the said ordinaries as aforesaid, and to us and to the apostolic see. And moreover, by the same authority and in the amplitude of apostolic benignity, we give concession and indulgence, to consecrate into other pious and salutary works any vows whatsoever, even those taken under oath and reserved to the apostolic see, always excepting vows of chastity, of religion, and of obligation which have been taken before a third person, and those which affect prejudicially a third person, as also those called penal vows, or preservatives against sin, unless the commutation for the time to come be adjudged to be a preservative against the commission of sin, not less effectual than was the original matter of the vow. And also validly to dispense jubilee penitents being in holy orders, and even being regulars, from occult irregularity contracted only in the exercise of those orders, and from all inflictions by their superiors on account of the violation of censures only. We do not, however, intend by these presents to grant dispensation from any other irregularity, either occult or public, or from any defect or disgrace, or any other incapacity or inability, in whatever manner contracted, or to grant any faculty of dispensing it to the aforesaid cases, or of rehabilitating and of restoring to the original status, 
even in foro conscientiae, nor to derogate from the Constitution published with opportune declarations by our predecessor Benedict the Fourteenth of happy memory, and beginning Sacramentum Penitentiae, under date the Calends of June in the year of our Lord's Incarnation, 1741, being the first year of his pontificate. Nor, lastly, do we intend that these presents should or could be of any avail for such persons as have been by us and by the apostolic see, or by any prelate or judge ecclesiastical, by name excommunicated, suspended, or interdicted, or in other way whatsoever declared or publicly denounced as having fallen under sentences and censures, unless, within the time of the year aforesaid, they shall have made satisfaction, and, if need be, shall have come to agreement with the parties in their case. Moreover, if, after the commencement of this jubilee, any persons, having the intention of gaining it, shall have been prevented by death from fulfilling the prescribed number of visits, we, desiring graciously to favor their pious and prompt intention, do will that they, being truly penitent, and having confessed their sins, and received the Holy Communion, shall participate in the aforesaid indulgence and remission, just the same as if they had actually visited the said churches on the prescribed days. But if any persons, after having by virtue of these presents obtained absolutions from censures or commutations of vows or the dispensations aforesaid, shall change that serious and sincere purpose also required for the gaining of the jubilee, and consequently for the performance of the other works necessary for gaining it, then, although such persons can scarcely be deemed free from the guilt of sin in regard to this matter, nevertheless we decree and declare that such absolutions, commutations, and dispensations obtained by them with the before-mentioned disposition do remain in force. We also will and decree that the present letter shall be, in all respects, valid and in force, and shall have and obtain their full effect, wheresoever they shall be published and put in execution by the ordinaries of places, and that they shall be fully available for all the faithful abiding in the favor and obedience of the apostolic see, whether they reside in such places at the time of such publication, or shall resort thither after a journey by sea or by land. And this, notwithstanding indulgences not to be granted ad instar, and other apostolic constitutions, and constitutions enacted in general, provincial, and synodal councils, notwithstanding any ordinances and general or special reservations of absolutions or relaxations, and of dispensations, notwithstanding any oaths of the mendicant and military orders of every kind, of congregations, and of institutes, notwithstanding any statutes confirmed by apostolic approval or in any other manner, notwithstanding any laws, usages, customs, privileges, indults, and letters apostolical granted to the same orders, notwithstanding especially those in which it is expressly forbidden to the members of any such order or congregation or institute to make their confession to a priest not a member of their own religious body. And although, to effect a valid derogation of all these things, and of their whole tenors, there ought to be made, 
a special, specific, express, and individual mention of them, or some other precise form ought to be employed for that purpose. We nevertheless hold all such tenors as recited, all necessary forms as exactly observed, pro hoc vice only, and for the purposes aforesaid only. We do make full derogation, all things whatsoever to the contrary, notwithstanding. But while we, in the discharge of our apostolic office, and according to the solicitude with which we must feel towards the universal flock of Christ, propose this salutary opportunity of remission and of obtaining grace, we must also address all patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops, and others ordinaries of places, prelates, or others having local ordinary jurisdiction in default of bishops, or of prelates exercising authority regularly, and being in favor and communion with the apostolic see, earnestly beseeching and imploring them, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of all pastors, that they would announce this great benefit to the people committed to their charge, and would exert themselves to the utmost that all the faithful may be reconciled to God by penance, and may turn the grace of the jubilee to the profit and advantage of their own souls. It will, therefore, be your principal care, venerable brethren, first, by public prayers, to implore the mercy of God, to the end that he would pour his light and grace into the minds of all, and then, with suitable instructions and admonitions, to lead the Christian people to become partakers of the fruits of the Jubilee, and correctly to understand what is the power and nature of the Christian Jubilee to the gain and advantage of souls, for as much as in it, in a spiritual manner, by the power of Christ our Lord, all those good things are abundantly accomplished which the old law, the messenger of things to come, brought every fiftieth year to the Jewish people. At the same time, let it be fittingly explained what is the effect of an indulgence, and what all those things are which must be performed in order to the beneficial confession of sins and the holy reception of the sacrament of the Eucharist. And since not only the example, but also the labors of the Church's ministry are very greatly needed, in order that the desired fruit of sanctification may be borne by the people of God, do you, venerable brethren, now at this time especially, not neglect, to kindle with energy the zeal of your priests, and it would conduce very much to the general good, if they, whenever it is possible, would set the Christian people an example of piety and religion, and by the help of spiritual exercises would renew the spirit of their holy calling, so that thereafter they may more profit to the saving of souls, they may engage in the discharge of their pastoral duties, and in the holding of missions amongst the people. Great are the evils of this present age. Much reparation must be made for them, and much is the good that remains to be done. Taken then the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, bestow all your care that your people may be led to detest the enormous crime of blasphemy, by which there is nothing so sacred but at the present time it is outraged, and that your people may know and do their duty in keeping holy the festival days, and in observing the laws of fasting and abstinence according to the precepts of God's church, 
and may thus escape the punishments which the neglect of these things has called down upon countries. And let your zeal and earnestness be equally vigilant and unfailing in upholding the discipline of the clergy and in providing for the right education of clerics. And by every means in your power, come to the rescue of imperiled youth, as you well know how great are the dangers to which it is exposed, and how terrible is the ruin to which it is liable. So bitter was this species of mischief to the heart of our divine Redeemer, that he said, Whosoever shall scandalize one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. St. Mark, chapter 9, verse 41. And nothing is more worthy of the season of the Holy Jubilee than that works of all kinds of charity should be carried out more zealously than common. And, therefore, it will be befitting your zeal, venerable brethren, to promote the relief of the poor, so that sins may be redeemed by almsgiving, the numerous advantages of which are set forth in Holy Scripture, and to the end that fruits of charity may be permanent and become more firmly established, it will be very opportune for charitable aid to be contributed towards the support or formation of those pious institutes which are deemed at this season to conduce in the greatest degree to the benefit of souls and bodies. If the intentions and earnest exertions of you all are concentrated on these objects, the certain result must be that Christ's kingdom and his justice will receive great advancement, and heaven in its mercy will in this acceptable time in these days of salvation pour forth great abundance of heavenly gifts upon the children of predilection in conclusion we direct our words to all the children of the catholic church without exception and we do with fatherly affection exhort you collectively and individually so to avail yourselves of the opportunity afforded by this jubilee for obtaining the forgiveness of your sins, as if you were sincere and earnest in the work of your own salvation. Now, if ever, it is absolutely necessary, dearly beloved children, to cleanse your conscience from dead works, to sacrifice the sacrifices of righteousness, to bring forth the fruits worthy of penance, and to sow in tears that we may reap in joy. God's majesty intimates clearly enough what he requires of us, for as much as now for a long while the reason of our wickedness we have lain under his upbraiding, under the breathing of the breath of his anger. Now, therefore, as men are wont, whenever they are in any very great need, to send ambassadors to neighboring nations to ask for succor, let us do better. Let us send an embassy to God. Let us implore His succor. Let us betake ourselves to Him with our whole heart, in prayer, in fasting, and in almsgiving. For by how much God is nearer to us, by so much are our enemies driven the farther off from us. St. Maximus Taranensis, Homily 91. But above all things, listen ye to the apostolic voice, for we are ambassadors to you from Christ you who labor and are heavy laden, 
who have erred from the way of salvation and are bowed down under the yoke of evil passions and of the devil's slavery. Do not despise the riches of the goodness and the patience and long-suffering of God. And while such abundant and easy means are afforded you of obtaining salvation, do not by your obstinacy render yourselves inexcusable before God your judge. Do not treasure up to yourselves wrath against the day of wrath and of the revelation of the just judgment of God. Return, therefore, ye backsliders, to your own heart. Be reconciled to God. The world is passing away, and its concupiscence. Cast away the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Cease to be the enemies of your own souls, that you may secure for them peace in this world and in the world to come, the eternal recompense of the just. Such is our prayer. Such are the things for which we shall not cease to implore the Lord most merciful. And all the children of the Catholic Church being united with us in these prayers, we are sure that we shall obtain all these good things from the Father of mercies. Meanwhile, let the apostolic benediction, which with great love and from our inmost heart, we now in the Lord impart to you all, venerable brethren, and to you, beloved sons, and to all members of the Catholic Church, be an earnest of all graces and all heavenly gifts conducing to a happy and salutary result of this holy work. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, the 24th day of December, in the year 1874, being the 29th year of our pontificate, Pope Pius IX. End of Encyclical Letter Gravibus Ecclesiae, the Jubilee of 1875, by Pope Pius IX. Read by Patrick Randall. Encyclical Letter Quod Nunquam on the Church in Prussia by Pope Pius IX. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Encyclical of His Holiness to the Prussian Episcopate To our venerable brethren, the Archbishops and Bishops of Prussia, Pius Pope the Ninth. Venerable brethren, health and apostolical benediction. Remembering as we do the stipulations concluded between this apostolic see and the Prussian government in the 21st year of the present century, for the benefit and welfare of the Catholic cause. We should never have thought possible that, which has actually and most lamentably come to pass in your country, venerable brethren. To that repose and peace which the Church of God was enjoying amongst you, there has succeeded a grievous and unlooked-for tempest. But the other day, there were proclaimed laws militating against the rights of the Church and inflicting, by their operation, severe punishments on many of her faithful and conscientious servants, both amongst the clergy and lady. To those laws there have since been added others, tending to the total overthrow of the Church's divine constitution and the destruction of the sacred rights of the Episcopate. For these laws attribute to lay magistrates the power of depriving the bishops and other ecclesiastical authorities of their dignity and of their episcopal jurisdiction. These laws have, moreover, placed numerous and enormous difficulties in the way of those called to exercise lawful authority pending the absence of the pastors who rule the flocks. 
These laws empower the chapters of the Metropolitan Churches, contrary to the canon law to elect vicars capitular at the time when the see is not vacant. To mention no other points, do not these laws authorize even the mayors of towns to appoint in the place of bishops men who are not even Catholics, and to confer upon such men ecclesiastical property, destined for the support of the clergy and of the churches? Unhappily you, venerable brethren, know but too well the mischief, the vexations, and evil treatment occasioned by these laws themselves and by the manner of their execution. We say no more on the subject, because we are unwilling to augment the grief of you all by reminding you of these sad events. But we are unable to keep silence on the subject of the evils that have afflicted the dioceses of Fosen-Yesen and Paderborn. Our venerable brethren, Mitislas, Archbishop of Posen and Yesen, and Conrad, Bishop of Paderborn, are still most unjustly declared to have forfeited their sees and are deprived of their episcopal authority. Their dioceses, too, remain bereft of the blessed direction of their excellent pastors and are overwhelmed with distress and trouble. It is true, indeed, that when we remember the words of our Lord, we ought rather to congratulate than to pity those two venerable brethren just named. Blessed shall you be when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. St. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Those venerable brethren have not been terrified at the imminent danger, nor at the punishments with which they were threatened. Not only have they defended the church's rights, and caused her precepts to be respected, but they in common with the other pastors of your country have held it an honor to receive an unjust judgment and to allow themselves to be punished with penalties appropriate only to criminals. Thereby they have afforded the most brilliant example of virtue and have given edification to the whole church. Although we owe to them rather our loudest praises than tears of pity, nevertheless the lowering of the episcopal dignity the blows struck at the liberty and at the rights of the church, the persecutions inflicted on the bishops above named and on all their colleagues, require that in virtue of our apostolic power given to us by God, we should raise our voice in denunciation of those laws and against the bad actions which they have done and which they are causing to be done, and that we should defend against impious violence with all energy and the divine authority the liberty of the church now trodden underfoot. In fulfillment of the duty of this apostolic see, we do publicly declare by this present encyclical to all whom it may concern, as also to the whole Catholic world, that these laws are null, because they are utterly opposed to the divine constitution of the Church. For it is to the men of power of this world that the Lord has made subject the bishops of his Church in all that concerns his sacred service, but to Peter, to whom he committed his sheep and lambs, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 21, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, no temporal power, however exalted, has the right to despoil of their episcopal dignity those who have been appointed by the Holy Ghost to govern the Church. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. To this sad state of things must be added the following fact, which is unworthy of a noble nation, and which, as we may well expect, will be, even by non-Catholics, who are yet impartial observers of events. These laws are excessively harsh and threaten with the severest punishments those who disobey them. They have the armed forces on their side, and they place peaceable and inoffensive citizens in the unhappy and pitiable situation of men who are oppressed by irresistible power, merely because their conscience bids them to resist these laws. One would say that such laws are made for slaves constrained to obey by terror, not for free citizens, of whom may rightly be expected a reasonable obedience. From what we have now said, it must not be imagined that those are excusable who, through fear, obey man rather than God. But especially guilty are the sacrilegious men who dare to take possession of churches and to perform ministrations therein relying on the support of the secular arm. Such persons shall not escape the justice of God. 
On the contrary, we do hereby declare that all those sacrilegious persons and all who shall in time to come commit similar crimes by usurping an ecclesiastical mission shall in virtue of the canon law be smitten de facto and de jure with the greater excommunication. We exhort the pious faithful not to assist at any mass celebrated by those men, nor to participate in the administration of any sacrament by them, and to avoid their company and their conversation, to the end that the evil leaven may not spoil the good peace. Amidst these tribulations, your courage and perseverance have afforded us great consolation under our sorrow. The rest of the clergy and the faithful have imitated you, venerable brethren, in the painful conflict in which you are engaged. So great has been their firmness in safeguarding Catholic rights and duties. So praiseworthy has been the conduct of each one that they have drawn upon themselves the eyes of all men, even of those who are most remote and have won their admiration. How could it be otherwise? As great as is the misfortune of soldiers who have lost their commander, so great is the glory of that bishop who sets an example to his brethren in the faith. Alas that we are unable to afford you some alleviations in your troubles. But, renewing and affirming once more our protest against all that is being done, contrary to the constitution of God's church and to her rights, protesting also against the violence so unjustly resorted to in your regard, we assure you that our counsel and our instruction suited to the circumstances shall never be denied you. Let those who are your enemies know that you commit no offense against royal authority and do nothing to its prejudice when you refuse to render to Caesar that which is God's. For it is written, We ought to obey God rather man. Let them know that every one of you is resolved to pay tribute to Caesar and to obey him in all things appertaining to the civil government, and that not by constraint, but for your conscience's sake. Therefore, be of good cheer. Go on as you have hitherto done, fulfilling all your duties and obeying the law of God, and great shall be your reward, because you shall have exercised patience and been unwearied in suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. Look unto him who has gone before you in tribulation far greater even than those which you have endured, and who was made subject to the pain of death, an ignominious and cruel death, in order that those who believe on him might learn to shun the favors of this world, and not to be dismayed at its terrors, to love tribulations for the love of the truth, and to fear and fly from the allurements of the earth. He it is who has placed you in the front of the battle, and he will grant to you the strength that you need for the conflict. In him we place all our hopes. Let us submit to his will and implore his mercy. You see that what he foretold has already come to pass. Then trust in him. He will give you all that he has promised. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but I have overcome the world. With faith in that victory to come, we humbly pray the Holy Ghost to grant you his peace and grace. In token of our special favor, we grant you with all our heart and to the whole of your clergy and all the faithful under your charge our apostolic benediction. Given at Rome at St. Peter's, the 5th day of February, in the year 1875, and of our pontificate, the 29th, Pius Pope IX. End of Encyclical Letter, Quod Nun Quam on the Church in Prussia by Pope Pius IX, read by Maria Angela Aragon.